Right, I'd like to welcome everyone to this conference, part of the Goldsmiths Library Black History Month, and also um, co-sponsored uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Renita Cox and Dr. Angelina Osborne. Um, Dr. Renita Cox, who um, is at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, uh, co-sponsoring this, um, as well as Dr. Angelina. And we are really thrilled as a trio to welcome everyone to this conference, Ain't I a Woman, the Black Woman in Historical and Contemporary Context. First of all, I would like to say that we want to really foster uh, um, and respect and co-create a conference free of discrimination based on age, disability, race, ethnicity, political belief, religion, gender, sexual orientation, language or culture. So this is really going to be a safe space um, for everyone uh, over the next four hours and continuing into uh, tomorrow um, as well. So welcome, We're very happy to, to have you here. It's going to be a fantastic session. I think I will, uh, after no further ado, uh, get on now um, with uh, my introductory speech um, and people will just let you through as you come in. Um, but have you ever felt as if you were living in parallel worlds? On the one hand, you are acquainted, related, love, amazing, strong, black, beautiful women. And you see yourself perhaps reflected in their faces, in their gait, laughter, and more. So that's the situation there. But on the one hand, there is also a deafening silence and invisibility in particular public spaces in public discourse, in the debate and conversations of the day, or when black girls and women are mentioned, it's always pejorative, the worst end of the stats, whether to do with mortality in childbirth, gangs, or any aspect of health. Only this year, we were told that black women in the UK are four times more likely to die in pregnancy or in childbirth. There is a big disparity between them and white women. And even the doctors said, that there needs to be a call for action. And you can find that in The Guardian from January this year. We are also told that black women are missing uh, from the UK's top 1%. And this was a report that came out from the London School of Economics Business Review blog. Black women are least likely to be amongst the UK's top earners. And the TUC, again, in another report said that black and ethnic minority women are around twice as likely as white workers to be employed in insecure jobs. So we can only just imagine the impact of COVID on many lives. Now, of course, there are exceptions and increasingly we see them, black women popping up in science, in politics, although for some you'd rather they kept quiet. We see them popping up across education, in medical health, fitness, so the picture is slowly changing. It's not just athletics, entertainment, or cringy daytime TV. Black women are increasingly more foregrounded across the board. During the late 20th century, I grew up then with this visible, invisible dichotomy, with the narratives of the outside at variance with a very strong and affirmative narrative of the home, with a mother that countered the negativity of outsiders who frankly had no clue about, about black women and their trajectories, and certainly not about her amazing life. I thought things would be different in academia. Spoiler alert, you know what I'm going to say. And in the discipline of history, they're not different by the way, in the discipline of history, I would defy any to find 10 articles in the last, I don't know, five years in some of our premier peer review history journals, such as 20th century British history, contemporary British history, the British Journal for the History of Science, Social History, Cultural or Social History, and many more titles that seriously address the whole range of the Black female experience and contribution to historical narratives of this country and beyond. We all know the stats about black women in the professorate. And after nearly 20 years in HE, I can count on one hand the number of black female history professors that I have met. Indeed, the only tenured history professor 
the only one in the whole country is going to be speaking later on today. So I can count on one, two, maybe three hands, those black British women who have earned PhDs in history in the UK higher education institutions. Two of them are co-organizers of this conference. You should listen to their journeys. That alone is a conference topic of itself. So this is why today and tomorrow will be so incredible. You will be exposed to those who identify as black females, individuals who identify as non-binary or as members of the LGBTQIA community who are historians of color and whose research illuminate varied and rich topic matters and add immeasurably to the field of historical research in the 20th century, 21st century. This is unusual. Even in my area of history, I can count on one hand historians that look like me that I have encountered on the conference circuit across the last, again, 10 uh, to 15 years. This is slowly changing, too slowly. And it is the usual practice in the age of our financial squeeze that the last to the table, the arrivals and their courses that should have been there long time back, as we would say, are often the ones targeted to be the first in the queue out when universities make their tough choices. Representation is very important, especially among the youth now grappling with society. It is great to see the ubiquity of David Olasoga and before him, Robert Beckford, because quite frankly, commissioning er editors can only deal with one articulate black man on TV at one time. However, in the pantheon of Lucy Worsley, Margaret Macmillan, Mary Beard, Antonia Fraser, Susanna Liscombe, Bethany Hughes, Kate Williams and others, even a cursory Google search vividly displays, pardon the pun, a black hole. Guess how many black UK female historians the, uh, the algorithms throw up? None. It is a scandal. Well, keep an eye on the names that you come across today and tomorrow. I have every faith that with the turning tide, even with the government's anti-woke pushback, we will see more historians of color challenging the cozy, comfy shibboleths of the gatekeepers in the academy. For sure, there are formidable hurdles, of access to funders of research and more, but we can't give up. It is so wonderful to see the new generation of resilient scholars across the board and historians of color in particular. Dr. Renita and Angelina and I are very different black women, but we share one thing in common. We refuse to be defined by the reductive lack of vision that the establishment had and continues to demonstrate towards us. We come from a very long line of overcomers and quite frankly, so do you, whoever you are. So we really invite you to be inspired over the course of the next two days. Enjoy the keynote speaker, the headline speakers, the poets, the professionals, the researchers. Welcome to the continued brightness of the future, despite what the naysayers would have you believe. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your engagement to come. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. So I would now like to introduce uh, our director, who is the first director of libraries in the UK and at a major university here, who just happens to be a black woman who's been brought, born and brought up in Blighty and is a force to be reckoned with herself in the HE library sector. Marilyn and the library, as I've said, are co-sponsors of this event. I would like to now pass on to Marilyn Clark. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and what a wonderful introduction to this amazing conference. Thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words before you begin. And congratulations to you, do, to Juanita, and to Angelina on organizing such a wonderful uh, conference over these next two afternoons. So Goldsmiths Library is very proud to be hosting this Brit, uh, Black History Month event. And we close this year's Black History Month and with this wonderful conference. 
as with previous years, I believe you are in for a treat. The subject matter, Black women and their conference on their contribution to history and society is worthy of interest no matter who you are. I'm excited to learn of the research and lessons we can draw from academic researchers and the headline speakers over the course of this conference. To kick off proceedings, I would like to share a poem with you, and I trust that it inspires no matter your backgrounds. It's a poem by an artist called Maud Salter. She was a Scottish Ghanaian artist, poet, photographer, and teacher. And I think the poem speaks to the theme of the conference. You can also find out more about Maud Salter's work at the Murray Edwards College in Cambridge right now until January next year, and also at the Tate Britain as part of uh, a, an exhibition called Walk Through British Art. So the poem I'd like to recite and share is as it's called As a Black Woman. As a black woman, the bearing of my child is a political act. I have been mounted in rape, bred from like cattle, mined for my fecundity. I have been denied abortion, denied contraception, denied my freedom to choose. I have been subjected to abortion, injected with contraception, sterilized without my consent. I have borne witness to the murders of my children by the clan, the front, the state. I have borne sons hung for rape for looking at a white girl. I have borne daughters short, shot for being liberationists. As a black woman, I have taken the power to choose to bear a black child, a political act. As a black woman, every act is a personal act. Every act is a political act. As a black woman, the personal is political, holds no empty rhetoric. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for all the organizers for allowing me to speak and I wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marilyn. We will now move on to panel one. Panel one will be moderated by Sophie. Over to you, Sophie. Hi everyone. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to go through a couple of bits of housekeeping, just the, the protocol, and then I'll introduce the speakers. Um, so this event is being recorded by joining in, you give your consent for it to be recorded. Um, please keep your audio on mute unless you're directly asked to unmute. Um, and please make sure that your name matches the name that you're registered under. This is just for you know, just, just for us to know who's here. Um, so if you are an and an I did identifiable, sorry, by name, you may be moved into the waiting room so that your name can be adjusted. Um, for questions, please put them in the chat while the panelists are speaking. And then at the end, um, you know, I'll, I'll have them and I'll be able to ask the questions directly to the panelists. The kind of quicker and, and uh, tighter your questions are, the more we can ask. So try to keep everything brief. Um, and yeah, and uh, the chat moderator me, uh, may ask you to unmute your audio and camera potentially, but we're going to try to keep the questions in the chat to make sure that we can run through things quickly. Um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, just a reminder that the space does not tolerate any form of discrimination or obscene language. Um, the first uh, presenter on this panel is Frankie Chappell. Uh, Frankie is a first year PhD student at UCL's Institute for the Americas, funded by the Wolfson Foundation. Her doctoral research focuses on the history of the group International Black Women for Wages for Housework and builds on her MA dissertation, which was called The Radical Ecology of Black Women for Wages for Housework, 1976-2000. Um, and the paper she's gonna to present today is called Pay Women, Not the, the Military, Black Women and Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. So Frankie, if you wanna take it away. <laughs> thank you, Sophie, and thank you to all the organizers as well. Um, I've got some slides, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. I've got a bit of background noise as well, but if it becomes too much, let me know. I'll try and put in some earphones. I think it's okay at the moment. So yeah, so the title of my paper today is Pay Women, Not the Military, Black Women and Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. So for people who don't know, Greenham Common uh, Women's Peace Camp was started in 1981. Um, it was in opposition to the sighting of cruise nuclear missiles at an airbase at Greenham in Berkshire, which is Southeast England. 
Um, it lasted for 19 years. So women were camped there for 19 years straight. Um, thousands of women ended up coming. And during its time, it captured the popular imagination and it was in quite a turbulent relationship with the press as well. Um, we get a glimpse of the experiences that black women might have had at the camp through accounts such as this one. So this is by Hope Messiah uh, in an anthology of black lesbian coming out stories by Lisa Seymour. And Hope describes her experience as, I am the only black woman at Greenham and I grow tired of the repeated refrain, why don't more black women come to Greenham? I ask what they are doing to reach out to black women and they look puzzled. I suggest they contact black women's groups and they don't know of any. How about having a black women only gate and they look totally confused. Eventually I draw away. I realize they don't want me to tell them what they could do. They want me as a black woman to tell them that there is some quirk in black women that stops them slash us from wanting to get involved in the struggle. So despite such experiences like hopes um, of this limited uh, the limits of a universal sisterhood, which was often pushed at places like Greenham, and commemorative events of the protest camp, which often represent it as the preserve of just the white women's peace movement. Uh, black women did engage quite consistently with the camp, and they helped to really shape the trajectory that it took. Such women came particularly from the group Black Women for Wages for Housework, and the King's Cross Women's Centre, which that group was a part of. So this paper will address the question quite simply of what practical and intellectual roles black women played at the peace camp. And the literature on the subject is really limited, but where it has engaged with the topic, it's mostly focused on the disputes and fallouts at the camp. And whilst these are important for reasons that we'll see, um, I want to argue that black women played an important role in the development of green and women's political thought and one particular section of the camp, which was called Yellowgate, became quite a dynamic, dynamic center of dialogue around the connections between race, gender, class, um, and peace and environmental issues. And as we examine the engagement of black women uh, with Greenham Common, it can broaden our understanding of black women's roles in the wider peace and environmental movements, as well as in the wider women's movement. It's worth noting that in this historical context, um, Black Women for Wages for Housework used Black to denote African-American in the US context, but like a lot of women's groups in Britain during this time, um, they used Black to mean uh, all women of colour or all people of colour, which we call political Blackness. Um, but the majority of the main actors in the group, and especially those who were involved in Greenham Common, um, were of African, African-Caribbean and African-American descent. So some background on the peace camp itself. So it started off as a march by Women for Life on Earth and they arrived at Greenham from Cardiff in Wales in September, 1981. And their aim was to challenge the sighting of the 96 nuclear cruise missiles that had been decided to plant there. They requested to debate, debate with the relevant authorities and they were obviously refused. Um, but instead they ended up camping just outside the airbase and refused to leave. They stayed there for a few months and in February of 1982, we decided that the peace camp would remain and it would become a women only camp. And Greenham as it's recognized today historically um, was born. On the other hand, the Wages for Housework Network began in 1972 and it was founded by activist Selma James. They demanded reimbursement for housework conceived in a kind of broad sense in order to highlight and dismantle the inequalities of the capitalist system, particularly the gendered ones. And the movement was often misconstrued as wanting to kind of trap women in the household, but actually the point was more to uh, disrupt the relationship between the household, the housewife and capitalism. Uh, by breaking down the household and the housewife as tools of capitalism. So in 1976, African-American Wilmette Brown and Barbados-born Margaret Prescott started Black Women for Wages for Housework in the US. And this is one of their US newsletters here. So the group would go on to operate in the UK, as we'll see, as well as in the Caribbean, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, also in Guyana and Canada and elsewhere. They took the legacies of slavery and colonialism as central to their use of the wages for housework perspective. 
and they gave emphasis to the different relations to labor between black and white women. A key influence for the group was the welfare rights movement of the 1960s onwards in the US. Um, and in fact, it was a conference about welfare which spawned black women for wages for housework in the first place. So by the late 70s, early 80s, co-founder Wilmot Brown had moved to uh, the UK and the group had bases in Bristol with a woman called Norma Steele and in London at the King's Cross Women's Centre, which is now called the Crossroads Women's Centre and was home to other wages for housework groups, as well as organisations like the English Collective of Prostitutes, which were allied with the cause. So it was some of these women that made connections with the Greenham Common Peace Camp from as early as 1982. They would eventually um, work on a rota to give support to the peace camp. This would allow women who stayed at the camp full time to sign on for benefits money, to go shopping and just to take a break. And by the, uh, the mid 1980s, the King's Cross women had formed their own peace collective to support Greenham. And they described themselves as women organizing to win back from the military industrial complex, the wealth and resources we have created and helping to ensure that the peace movement takes on all our daily struggles for survival against racism, overwork, ill health and poverty, starting with black and third world women and children. So in their work at Greenham, Black Women for Wages for Housework brought with them this approach and the slogan, pay women, not the military. And this tied together their core aim of demanding money for women, as well as an anti-militarist stance, and it drew quite heavily on the welfare rights movement. So in one publication by a Milwaukee County welfare rights organization, um, the writer urged the United States government to stop subsidizing the rich, the corporations and the military and start ensuring an adequate income for all Americans through wages, welfare or both. Co-founder uh, Wilmot Brown wrote her own book called Black Women in the Peace Movement, and she draws heavily on welfare rights literature in it. And she comes to the conclusion that there has always been a black women's peace movement. Black women have always been giving leadership to the peace movement as a whole by fighting on all the issues of black women's survival internationally, issues which are still not recognized as peace issues. And she argues that the threat of nuclear war and nuclear power is inseparable from day-to-day -day military industrial repression. Sex, race, and class issues are peace issues. And this analysis was key to how Black Women for Wages for Housework members engaged with Greenham and tried to make it accessible and relevant to communities of color. Initially, this approach was really successful um, in tying together anti-racist and anti-war activism. So some of the members of Wages for Housework and Green and Women in 1986 campaigned for the removal of three organizations from the International Year of Peace Council. So these organizations were Women and Families for Defense, Peace Through NATO, and Coalition for Peace Through Security, and they were viewed as generally quite right-wing groups. At one meeting, Brown presented a number of letters of support from groups connect, uh, committed to connecting peace with anti-racist organizing. And they opposed the inclusion of these uh, organizations on the International Year of Peace because they saw them as undermining the peace movement and attacking black people. This, this coalition became the highlight of the International Year of Peace for Greenham and uh, Wages for Housework Women. And Wilmot Brown and Selma James claimed that the victory of the International Year of Peace was that black women's anti-racist, anti-fascist, local CND and other organizations built an alternative peace network, affirming the autonomy of the peace movement from all governments, the key to winning. This is a direct reflection of how black women for wages for housework organized and their approach to widening the issue of peace um, and to make it relevant to communities of color. And that's something which from Hope Messiah's story we heard at the beginning, it's clear Greenham really struggled to do. But this kind of work was not universally appreciated by the other women at Greenham Common. In 1987 in June, Greenham women and Wages for Housework members attended a World Congress of Women in Moscow. There was a dedicated workshop on Greenham Common and Wilmette Brown gave a talk about the activities of Black Women for Wages for Housework, the King's Cross Centre and her own book and the connections between peace and anti-racist uh, activism. During the talk, a number of women from a Greenham support group 
called Ga uh, Camden Green and Women walked out of the room and there were other offensive reactions uh, to Wilmette's talk during and after she spoke. And once they returned from Moscow, the fallout continued with wages for housework, women claiming that the women who had walked out had been racist and other women at Greenham defending them and saying that nothing of any significance had happened. Um, but the fallout continued and the division became worse. Uh, it was even covered by the mainstream press who were otherwise uninterested in Greenham. But amongst the division, Yellowgate and King's Cross women and Black wage, women for wages for housework women were able to take on a more overt anti-racist stance. So newsletter covers from the wider camp previous to this point and after this point don't really have much of an anti-racist message, at least on the cover of them. Um, but newsletters produced by Yellowgate had an anti-racist message at their core. So on the left here, um, the newsletter from 87 to 88 talks about taking action on racism and on the right uh, the April 1988 newsletter uh, states that they're against the state, racism, militarism and poverty. Uh, Katrina Howes who was a white woman who had been at Yellowgate since almost the beginning said that the Yellowgate's new anti-racist stance was the most important development at the camp but Wilmot Brown, unsurprisingly, was particularly vilified in the press, and they seemed to take glee in their racialized and salacious reporting of the Greenham infighting. One article described the King's Cross and Black Women for Wages for Housework Women as the Black Mafia, and there was a growing view of the group as overbearing and infiltrating different activist groups. But what was more important was that Yellowgate's anti-racist stance was really appreciated by the few women of colour who were present. One letter by a woman called Mika May talked about how much she appreciated how uh, what Wilmet and the other King's Cross women had done in kind of broadening the idea of peace. So the evidence suggests then that the presence of Black women for wages for housework at the camp did more than just ferment division, as the press would argue, but it actually helped to produce a multifaceted approach to peace activism, which uncompromisingly centred women of colour. Practically, the uh, Black women of King's Cross Women's Centre and Black Women for Wages for Housework provided invaluable support to the women at Greenham with volunteer time and donations. Uh, but also intellectually, these women were able to fundamentally challenge the flaws which they and other women of colour and working class women saw at, uh, within the movement. They were met with backlash and have since termed it a witch hunt, but they persisted and their later work was shaped by their engagement with the women's peace movement and environmental issues. In the late 1980s and 1990s, Black Women for Wages for Housework led a powerful campaign against the building of a new nuclear power station in Somerset, which is Southwest England, called Hinkley Point C. And again, they were able to make vital connections between environmental issues and the effects on working class communities of color in the inner cities. And in the background here is some of the literature that came out of that campaign. Uh, today, as women of colour in the global women's strike, and with many of the same members as in the 80s and 90s, the group contributes to a radical approach to climate justice and campaigns for recognition and payment for all caring work for people and planet. So to conclude, oral history interviews with Green and Women reflect the lingering strength of feeling around the events following the Moscow Conference and the different disputes that happened at Greenham. And there's perhaps an unwillingness to challenge Greenham, which lies behind the exclusion of these tensions in general histories and chronologies of the camp. But these tensions are crucial because they help us to excavate not only these more predictable stories of how Greenham failed in a lot of ways to deal with race and challenge racism, but also the more productive stories in which Black women's campaigning set a precedent for how peace activism could make connections with wider struggles. Walmart Brown proclaimed in her book, after all, that there has always been a Black women's peace movement. The work of Black Women for Wages for Housework at Greenham contributes to a history of Black women, British women's peace activism, which connects to the work undertaken elsewhere in the world, like the welfare rights movement of the 60s. And it provides us with an underappreciated example of multifaceted intersectional activism. And there's some of my citations just for reference. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Frankie, for what was a really, really fascinating presentation, which um, I'm sure people will have loads of questions about. So yeah, just a reminder, you can pop them in the chat. And then our next panelist, I don't think is actually here right now because she is in Egypt, but she has sent a, a recording of her um, delivering her presentation, which we're going to share with you now. And then hopefully she can join us for the Q&A. And if not, you know, we'll just enjoy the, the presentation. So, um, sorry, I will read her short bio. <laughs> um, Nicola Zawadi is a multi-award winning self-shooting feminist filmmaker with a lens on women. She was born in Tanzania, raised in Trinidad and Tobago and attended university in the UK. Nicola's collaborative filmmaking process draws up upon, sorry, almost 20 years working with civil society, government and multilateral organizations. Since 2012, she's made films with and about women in Trinidad, the UK, Kenya, Tanzania and Myanmar, covering subjects from female genital mutilation to black women decolonizing the literary canon, disability and a 47 year old single and child free woman who feeling invisible searches for the antidote. Antidote, sorry. Um, Nicola uses filmmaking as a tool for facilitating the women who tell their stories to empower themselves and to shift the dominant hegemonic narratives. Most, uh, most recently, Nicola's film Becky has won awards at the Women of the 50 Film Festival and the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival. Currently in production is a documentary on Black women's experience of grief, loss, and bereavement in the UK. Um, so, yeah, here, here we go um oh, okay sorry and the the yeah it's called black women feminism and ethical film production hello sophie you might want to click the bit where it says um, add sound when you share your screen there's a there's a little box that says add sound and that's why we I'm not the one here. sharing my screen it's oh who's sharing I'm a feminist filmmaker okay. who wants to see more women in front and behind the camera simply because I think the world we live in is fascinating and diverse and it's in no way represented on our screens to achieve this diversity on screen we need to diversify the people behind the camera I make films with and about women whose accomplishments are global, as well as those whose achievements, although as inspiring, may not be as far reaching. I work with women to create films in which they are centre stage and who stand in their power as self-determining subjects rather than passive objects. In filmmaking, the word subject is often used to refer to the person being discussed. Subject can also be used to denote someone who is being dominated by someone else. For this reason, I call the women who share their stories with me on film Storytellers with a capital S to confer their importance. The problem with this is that story can have connotations of falsities, but for now, that's the word I use. My definition of feminism is being against all oppression and working for social justice and transformation, individual and societal. Everyone's human rights must be upheld. Women, men, boys, girls, refugees, Afghanistanis, you and me. As a black woman, I have a personal connection with black women. And no, it doesn't mean I don't connect with men or white folk. It simply means that I'm passionate about issues that affect black women. I understand that where discrimination based on race, gender and class intersect, the effect is a triple whammy. Most of the women I work with in making films of their stories tell me that they want other women to know what they went through. They want women in similar situations to know that they are not alone, that there are solutions and that things can be different. Their wish to relieve women of the oppression that they themselves experienced makes them feminists. Of the women whose stories I've made into films, Caroline wanted other women with obstetric fistula, the medical condition that occurs when a woman has a prolonged obstructive labor and that results in tears and rips so that you're basically leaking constantly. Caroline, she wanted to know, she wanted women to know it can be repaired. In Kenya, one woman who I can't name lived in the informal settlement Mathari, one of the largest temporary settlements in Nairobi with half a million residents. Her situation was unusual in that she had been able to confide in a friend about her unwanted pregnancy. Somehow, these two women managed to pool enough money to pay for a safe abortion. In Kenya, seven women die every day 
from unsafe abortions. So this probably saved her life. Her message to women was simple. There is a place where you can go and have safe abortions. Three of my main challenges as a feminist filmmaker are one, to tell the story of the woman I'm working with, not my story. I see myself as a channel for the storyteller to tell her story, whilst I also act as a mirror so that she may see herself. I can't pretend I'm not there. I operate the camera, I'm the editor, and often the interviewer. Two, to work in a way that deepens the viewer's understanding of the storyteller's essence, the way she experiences the world, and to convey this in a manner that is dignified, humane, and true to the storyteller's subjectivity. Three, to make films in a manner that is empowering for the storyteller. Today, I'll share with you a bit about my filmmaking process, some of the associated pitfalls, and how I try to overcome them. I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, where the majority of people are black and brown, and I had light skin. I attended a government-funded school for girls with some of the best grades in the equivalent of the 11 plus exam. The limitations I have faced in life have been more a consequence of my having a vagina than the color of my skin. As a girl, I came to understand that outside our home, there were gendered expectations of women. As I became older, I experienced undesired attention from men who expected me to give them my attention. Every single time I walked into town, men felt entitled to comment on my body and my existence, as they did other women. On the days that I ignored them, their lewd comments became abusive and often homophobic. Why did women have to experience this sexist behavior? Like many, I discovered I was black when, aged 11, I came to school in the UK for a term. However, later in my 20s, I learned from a white Irish woman that I was friendly with that I wasn't really black. She'd been in court on racist charges, so she knew what black was. In Trinidad, in my early 30s, our housekeeper, whose skin was lighter than mine, informed me that I was white. Last year in Kenya, the dark-skinned housekeeper where I stayed called me Mzungu, the word for a white person. I showed her the photographs of my black father and my white mother and asked her why she called me white when my father's black. She laughed. When I relocated to the UK in 2015, I'd go to lots of black events. Often the people I spoke to seemed interested when I said I was a Trini. However, their interest waned when I told them I'd arrived just six months before. It was as though it had been assumed that we had a shared experience, only to find that the assumption was now that we hadn't. These varied concepts started me thinking about how the intersecting characteristics of race, gender and class are cultural constructions that vary with geography and time. When I came to the UK to study documentary, I realised the representations that I saw on screen rarely conveyed this complexity. I began to think about the ways in which black and brown people are represented in the media, usually by other people. I wanted to see a variety of complex and nuanced black women on screen. Working as a development practitioner on environmental initiatives in Trinidad, and in particular as an action researcher with the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, this equipped me with the language and tools to better understand how differently women and men, girls and boys, experience the world. This is an example of one such difference. In two farming communities in Nariva, which is the largest freshwater wetland in Trinidad, men wanted more water for their crops, whereas the women wanted clean water for their newborn babies. The combination of my Trini and UK experiences led me to start considering the ways in which black women are represented in development and how I, as a filmmaker with a development background, can use my privilege, my skills and experience to support them to empower themselves. The Jamaican British cultural theorist Stuart Hall wrote about the ways in which cultural identities are similar and different and about cultural identity and cinematic representation as being positioned in a particular context. Hall wrote, we all write and speak from a particular place and time. 
His description of his position included his childhood and adolescence in Jamaica, his adulthood in England and his being lower middle class. Walking through Mathare, Nairobi, I must have seemed other. I certainly felt other and vulnerable as a lone, light-skinned foreign woman loaded up with a backpack full of expensive equipment. These words of Hall resonated with me. Vis-a-vis -vis the developed West, we are very much the same. We belong to the marginal, underdeveloped, the periphery, the other. Being raised in the post-colonial society of Trinidad and Tobago gives me a certain familiarity with other English-speaking post-colonial societies like Kenya. My first-hand experience of the complexity and constantly changing perspectives of people and their relationships makes me well-placed to use filmmaking as a tool to unpick and convey the constructions. I use filmmaking to, in Hall's terminology, reposition us black women, bringing us from the margins to the centre as self-determining self -determining human beings negotiating challenges in the world we live. Attempting to reposition the women storytellers I work with requires a constant repositioning of myself so that I can align with them and almost channel their story through me. I can't pretend that I'm objective, but I can align my subjectivity with theirs. I do this by choosing topics about which I'm passionate and choosing clients with shared interests. I've made films on genital, female genital mutilation, obstetric fistula, disability, and my experience of being single and child-free at 47. I start from Hall's politics of position by becoming more self-aware and being open to learning about the women I will be working with. What's her experience of the world? How has it shaped her? I try to put myself in her shoes to truly understand her position, the way she experiences it so that I can convey her voice accurately. My experience of different people helps me to understand that my belief system is only a construction and it's only real to me. This helps me understand the belief systems of the women I meet, even if they aren't my own. This doubled with choosing to work on projects about which I am passionate helps me achieve this objective, but by the nature of being human, it must be imperfect. For example, I believe women over the age of 18 have the right to choose to be circumcised. However, I don't condone violence and I'm against all circumcision of girls and boys. So I'd be unlikely to make a film that promotes circumcision. Participation plays a key role in the filmmaking process towards repositioning. The attention is on the storyteller who is given center stage and to emphasize the importance of her story and of sharing. Together we research and learn through conversation, becoming transformed by the end. At its best, the interaction between the storyteller and myself changes both of us in some way. It could even be described as action research in that we're both active. The storyteller reflects and in turn makes me reflect and respond. When filming, I use inconspicuous equipment and I make it clear to the storyteller that she leads the filming, that she is in charge of where the conversation goes, what she wants to talk about or not talk about whether she wants her identity protected or not. It's her story to tell in the way that she wants. In this space, she has the power to decide. She also has a say on the final edit. Recently, when filming, one of the women's description of the minutiae growing up black helped me understand her life experience as a black woman in the UK in a visceral way that I'd never felt before. I wondered whether my interactions with women with whom I do not share a common language or women whose English vocabulary is modest limits the quality of our interaction and thus the final film. This woman was highly articulate with an extensive vocabulary. English is my native language and I am fluent in Spanish. English is the only language in which I have a love for the precision of words and rely heavily upon them. But how much is lost in translation? How much of the communication during filming is unspoken? Do I sometimes misrepresent or misconvey the stories of the women who are less verbally articulate? The chances of misrepresentation are reduced the more the women storyteller is involved in the filmmaking process. Making the film Caroline, Caroline and I 
spent a couple of hours in conversation, but we had no subsequent contact due to geogra geographical and technological constraints. Caroline did approve the, full, uh, the film before it was publicly screened, though. In making Becky, it was different. The conversation between Becky and I lasted a couple of hours, but Becky and I shared an apartment for a week and the film was edited over a two-year period. Over this period, Becky and I became friends. On WhatsApp, I would ask her, when you said this, did you mean this or did you mean that? And I would send her versions of the edict and she would provide feedback. Becky and I connected in a way that Caroline and I didn't. Becky participated in a way that Caroline did not. Consequently, Becky is, I think, a more complex film and it's won some awards. Did Becky and I connect because Becky had tertiary education and has traveled in Europe and worked in other African countries? Was it because Caroline and I had less in common? I'd like to think that it was the geography and the technology limitations rather than any inability of mine to understand her reality that prevented us from connecting in the way that Becky and I did. But is that really true? Laura Mulvey coined the term male gaze. This term describes the fact that in a male-dominated industry, it's the man who writes the script that determines on-screen action, a man who moves the camera, a man who directs the film. So what the audience actually sees is a gaze that's created by men. Spectators see women as passive objects, while male actors are seen as active decision makers driving the action. The women in the films I make are not passive props or objects used by men to advance their storyline. They are subjects who act. They are complex human beings who shape their lives and face their challenges with agency, and they have successes and failures just like the rest of us. They are not the other. The camera is used in a way that places the woman in the center of the frame. She is the master of her world, whatever the outcome, a world we are privy to witness. The focus is on her face, her expressions, and she's not sexualized. It's all well and good to make films of black women's lived realities. However, this opens up the question of film distribution so that these films are seen and have a chance to change the status quo around issues pertaining to social justice and subverting the invisibilization and marginalization of black women. Distribution is a huge limitation to spreading the word of the black woman in the films I make who demonstrate, according to Bell Hooks, an oppositional gaze that is, one that involves political rebellion and resistance against the repression of a black person's right to look. A gaze that says, look at me, ain't I a woman? Thank you. Great, so that was also absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Nicola. And now onto our last panelist. I'm keeping my presentation really brief, so she has time to talk and we have time to ask questions. Um, Lydia Ayame Haraide is a doctoral researcher in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Goldsmith. And her paper today is called The Green Black Feminist Theory, Black Women and Ecology. Thank you, Sophie. I hope you can hear me. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's made this conference happen and for everybody uh, for being in this space. It's a really exciting um, event to be attending. So as Sophie mentioned, my name is Lydia um, and I'm a PhD researcher at Goldsmiths and my PhD is in politics. Um, I'm situated in London in the UK, uh, the place at which I think, where I theorize, where I try to act. Um, and this is also where I grew up. And so as much as I try to read diversely and engage in conversations beyond my location, I do think my situatedness is, is partly um, influenced by my growing up in London and, and being here. And I think it's important to disclose this. Um, rather than presenting you a set of findings today, I'd like to invite you into conversation to think collectively about some of the themes that this conference is addressing and hopefully some of the questions and ideas that I, I will try to propose in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so as you will all know, in recent years, environmental issues have featured more heavily in public consciousness, perhaps more heavily than ever before. And they feature in mainstream media coverage, in the discourses of elected politicians, and um, even in popular culture. But what isn't always foregrounded is that black women, indigenous women, and women of color will be, and already have been, hardest hit by the effects of ecological crisis across the world. 
And these women have also long been at the front lines of environmental struggle, as Frankie's presentation showed us. And if we, if we look to the women who came before us and to the women who are resisting now, we can find lots of exciting, interesting and complex praxis that speaks to the concerns of black feminism on a burning planet. So these women are moving towards a green black feminism. So the question that this paper is organized around is, is this one. What does it mean to think about ecology from a black feminist perspective? So as we think more about ecology and environmentalism in our current social and political landscapes, I want to explore these issues from a black feminist perspective, as it's a perspective that is not usually foregrounded in the large mainstream platforms that are guiding and influencing the collective discussion about ecological crisis and climate breakdown. So in the first part of this presentation, I explore some of the challenges that we face when we're thinking about these issues. And I draw from black feminist ecological praxis to think deeply about these issues, which I think are theoretical and with material consequences um, for the ways that we choose to frame and um, organize environmental resistance. And I should say here quickly that my own academic background and training is largely in political theory and literary studies, although my current doctoral research tries to take a more empirical approach. So in my work, I'm trying always to mix an approach of, of being theoretical, of understanding the discursive and taking into account the material as well. And this is a challenge which I sometimes fall short of, but it, it's a commitment that I do think is of great value. In the second part, um, I want to suggest what I understand as some of the important aspects of theorizing a green black feminism. And I draw on existing scholarship to articulate some of the positive centerings that a green black feminism might affect. And so in particular, this is centering marginality, thinking about intersectionality and a structural approach, and also having the courage to be creative in constructing alternative cosmologies to those that dominate our current discussions about the environment. So to the first part, the challenges of which there are many, but I just want to pick up on two specific ones here that I see emerging as we try to move towards this green black feminist theory. And these challenges are, are both historical in nature and more specifically, they're concerned with the legacies of European empire. So the first is the, the nature culture binary as a colonial legacy. So the theoretical baggage of the nature culture binary and all of the binaries that come with it are significant because of the place that black women, indigenous women and women of color hold within this binary. So we've been situated on the side of nature and, and this, this binary has been talked about by a number of, of feminists, eco-feminists, post-colonialists, um, all range of scholars and activists. And um, Val Plumwood has, has given us a really interesting um, kind of tableau which lists all of the types of binaries that pair together and that there are hierarchical binaries so culture reigns over, over nature, reason over nature, male, female and so on. And this binary is featured heavily in civilizing discourses which attempted to justify and legitimize slavery, colonialism and brutality um, across the world and so nature in this binary is something that's to be Tamed, something that's free to be exploited and this is the way this is something that really resonates with the experiences of, of black women of women of color and indigenous women across history and so knowing this might make us feel a bit hesitant about emphasizing a proximity between nature and black women and it raises questions for, for how we talk about ourselves in relation to what we call nature so are black women women intrinsically more connected to nature well, extracting ourselves from this notion of nature seems quite troubling because the binaristic di distance that was created in the first place by colonial discourses is what has enabled the obje objectification and exploitation of that which has been associated with, with nature. So clearly there are lots of questions about this binary and, and how we think about ourselves within, within this binary and, and how we try to overcome it. And so black women together with indigenous women have been reconceptualizing the notion of nature and the environment in their activism. And so in one example we can think of is the US environmental justice movement um, where people have been broadening the concept of environmental risk beyond 
the sometimes narrow conception that we can see in, in mainstream environmental discourse, and as Tishi and Amashon Dupre has argued. So um, these women have been weaving health into conversations about environment and, and moving things away from this binary and trying to transcend it. So we can redraw the boundaries of the environment and what we understand as nature, what we understand as human culture, and what we understand as being of value. Um, so that's the, the first main challenge I see in, as we move towards um, a green black feminist theory. The second is, is that of the kind of global north, global south divide that, that we can think about in terms of ecologically unequal exchange. So that's thinking about the inequalities, the global inequalities that frame the climate and ecological crisis. So ecological issues are necessarily transnational and international in nature, and the root causes of them are as well. And in terms of mainstream environmentalism, there can be a tendency to look inwards um, and to think about how these issues affect one particular region or to go to the other extreme and to imagine this blanket, homogenous collective threat where we are all in the same boat. So how can we carry with us the recognition of this transnational and international nature of empire, of ecological breakdown and climate crisis, and also, as Tyre Miles has argued, of Black feminist ecology? Well, Black feminist, feminist ecological praxis have already been disrupting hegemonic environmentalisms that are not accounting for the ways that the same processes that drive ecological degradation are also driving social, political, and economic domination across the world. So not black feminist in name, um, the group Wretched of the Earth have kind of partly drawn on this, this notion in their collective um, open letter to Extinction Rebellion UK. So Wretched of the Earth called for a more of an attentiveness within the environment, environmental movement to the colonial roots of the ecological crisis we face today and the concerns of intersectionality. So that's to recognize that we don't face this collective blanket threat in the climate crisis. There are those who will be hit first and worst and the effects of the climate crisis compound with existing um, social and political cleavages. So this is a hint to the role of racialized capitalism as a driver of the climate and ecological crisis. And so if we name the source of ecological threat, the system of racialized capitalism, then we're determining the par parameters of change as Megan Tinsley recently argued in an event hosted by the British Sociological Association. So I return here to um, one of the, the big giants of black feminism, who is Audre Lorde. And Audre Lorde wrote that the master's tools will never dismantle, dismantle the master's house. And I'm sure that's a, a line that you, you all know and, and um, have heard cited regularly. Um, so I think in this context, if we name racialized capitalism as the problem, then we know that racialized capitalism cannot be part of the solution. And therefore, when we articulate a green black feminist theory or praxis, we're not simply calling for black women's representation in existing structures, and we're certainly not calling for ostensibly greener forms of capitalism. What then are we calling for? Well, this is something I'm still reflecting on, but I want to use the rest of the very little time I have to offer a few thoughts that I'm still developing around this, and I very much encourage your engagement in the discussion section of this panel. Um, so I think in thinking about a green black feminist theory, we can turn to Bell Hooks who talks about centering the margins. Marginality is important because it gives an alternative approach to the dominant one. So green black feminism's methodology draws in many ways from standpoint theory. It tells us as Patricia Hill Collins does that we understand our own oppression. And if we understand our own oppression, our perspectives are valuable and they, they have something useful to add to the conversation. Um, so we can center marginality as a means to forging alternative frameworks to that which we already have. And that's what we desperately need, clearly. Secondly, um, green black feminism moves to explain ecological crisis. So it draws on the tenets of eco-feminisms and eco-womanisms, which argue that there's resonance between the exploitation of what we call nature and the exploitation of of social groups amongst humans, such as black women, women of color and indigenous women. So this is a structural analysis of the systemic architectures that provoke the crisis of exploitation. Um, and, and so also, again, in terms of this resonance between what we call nature and humans, 
it moves us towards this interspecies solidarity. When we connect our struggle with, with this struggle of nature, quote unquote nature, then um, we understand that, the, that we move towards um, a position that tries to fight for both. Um, and then thirdly, intersectionality. So green black feminism proposes a joined up approach. And this is something that we can see in the activism of, of people like um, Wangari Matai, for example, who had uh, founded the Green Belt Movement in Kenya and she'd really strove to, to put women's rights and human's rights in parallel with kind of environmental rights. So thinking about these struggles as interconnected. Um, and again, this also has implications for policy because we move away from questions which put environmental well-being and economic well-being at odds with each other and, and move towards uh, an approach that is, is better for everyone really and, and ensures that it's not looking at issues from a siloed perspective. And then finally, this thinking about green black feminism as this pro project of imagination and creativity. So it's a project which disrupts hegemonic narratives, discourses and practices. And this is something that's really difficult, that's really challenging because we, we are used to what we're used to and, and moving towards something new can be challenging. So um, green black feminism as black feminism always has done strives for liberation. And so it counterposes this mainstream normative project of destruction that we see with one of creation. And so green black feminism is imaginative, it's constructive, it deconstructs, but it also reconstructs. And it's a project in process and it's in progress. Um, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lydia. This was so um, helpful and interesting. So if people wanna drop questions in the chat, we have about five minutes. Um, and uh, I guess I can just start you off while people write them. Um, Frankie and, and um, Lydia, I think it was really interesting how much your um, presentations kind of talked to each other. And I wondered if um, in both your cases, you kind of, so Frankie, if you, if you learn sometimes by looking at current struggles and Lydia, if for your research, you looked back um, and how that might yeah, inform it. I just would love to hear you two talk about it. Um, yeah, definitely. Like Lydia mentioned a few scholars that I, read for my dissertation, which was focusing specifically on the ecology of the Black Women for Wages for Housework group. Um, and Anima Sean Ducre in particular, like these scholars who are thinking now about how we can move towards this kind of Black femi feminist ecology and, and Lydia's idea of green Black feminism. I, I think for me, it was a case of using that current thinking to look back at um, what Black Women for Wages for Housework did and, and kind of put those two theories together because I, even though it was historical and this talk was historical I think it's important to always relate that to what we're trying to do in the present and present struggles and so I think yeah they definitely speak to each other really easily. Yeah I think definitely that that connection between history and the contemporary is extremely important. And I think something that you mentioned, Frankie, was that the, the literature is still kind of growing, even thinking about the historical aspects. I'm really grateful to scholars like yourself for, for helping us to understand um, the place of black women in these struggles because we've been written out of them. And often when I look into the histories, I'm thinking about these colonial aspects of conservationism. And, and actually we could be thinking about the, the amazing stuff that black women have been doing because it, it has been going on. So yeah, definitely that that connection is extremely important. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, right, so questions anyone? Um, if we can try to keep them moving quickly. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, I don't know if Juanita, you got any? I can't see her. Otherwise I can, I can okay, well, then I can just keep going. Um, I thought that something that was quite, um, quite also fascinating was kind of the sort of attention to minute details and the comparisons um, in, in both of, kind of in both of your presentations. And um, I was also wondering, given everything that's going on currently with climate protests and kind of thinking about disruption and resistance, um, I wondered if like a sort of green black feminist approach or, or a sort of like historical approach like the one you have, Frankie, um, how, how do these help you think about the current moment in that the very current moment of the protesters that are right now on the streets um, in England? I don't know if this is helpful, but yeah. Um, okay, okay, first. Um, yeah, I think it's really relevant specifically because 
a lot of so black women for wages for housework they were an autonomous group within this network and I kind of mentioned briefly how they um developed this very specific approach to ecology and environmental work but what I find interesting about them is how they were able to retain their autonomy um, and organize as women of color specifically um, but constantly worked in solidarity with the other groups in the network and I think that's something that Lydia mentioned how Wretched of the Earth has um, kind of given challenge to some of the other environmentalist groups at the moment who repeat a lot of the issues of the past in not being able to do that and so I think in looking at the some of these histories where that's been successfully done even if there's not that many of them um is really important for especially because th this history is not particularly old it's like 40 odd years ago um so I think it's really useful for us to look at that in terms of how we can make those connections because otherwise it's hard to see how these struggles can have like sustenance and be sustainable if they're not making all these different connections. Great. Yeah, I would add, oh, sorry. Actually, sorry, Lydia, no, no, don't worry. It's because there's one question that came oh, yeah. in the chat. So I thought maybe I could give this one to you and then we'll have to wrap up. So unfortunately I can't have both of you on that one. But so this question is, can I ask regarding black women and nature as people have affinity with environment, do people feel that if we don't buy into derogatory language and trust in our self-knowledge, for example, tapping into our African heritage, this is our way forward together. I'm not sure that I 100% understand the question, but I feel it's like the link between Black women and nature. Um, and it kind of echoes some of the things you talked about, Lydia, so. Yes, definitely. I think that's a really interesting question. It's one I'm grappling with myself. I think this connection between Black women and nature is a difficult one. It's a prickly one because you don't want to slip into essentialism and claiming that Black women are, you know, are all this or all that because we're not all anything other than that we're all Black women, that, you know, there's heterogeneity, heterogeneity within this group that we call Black women. So what do we mean when we're, we're talking about this affinity with nature, which for some individual black women is really important. I mean, it, it can be hard to talk about that on a group level um, versus an individual level. So I think those are important discussions to be had. And I think on a philosophical level, they're really difficult to, to unpick and, and to, to arrive at what feels like a satisfactory conclusion. But I, I think that's a definitely an important question in thinking about how we relate as black women to nature and how we want to. Well, wow, thank you so much. I feel like this is a really interesting note to end on and um, loads of fruit for thought. So thank you so much again to Frankie and Lydia and Nicola as well, who isn't with us. But um, if you all want to join me in a virtual round of applause, I'm not sure how to do this. But thank you so much. It was fascinating. Um, yeah, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie, and to all your contributors. So my name is June Reed. I'm welcoming anybody who's just recently joined. Throughout the um, event today, you will hear all the moderators um, repeat the following. Um, this event is being recorded. By joining this event, you are giving your consent to be part of that recording. Could you please keep your audio on mute unless you're directly asked to unmute? Please make sure your name matches the name you are registered under. If you are unidentifiable by name, you may be moved into the waiting room so your name can be adjusted. Um, also, please use the fact chat facility to comment or ask any questions. We're ready. It's all about um, getting responses from you. And um, as the chat mod moderator, I may ask you to unmute your, your audio and camera so you can speak directly to the presenter. Finally, and most importantly, this space does not tolerate any form of discrimination or obscene language. So the panel that I'm very, very honoured to be moderating today is called the, Host the Historical and Contemporary Resistance of the Rastafari Women. And my first speaker is Dr Shamara Al-Hassan, who is an Assistant Professor of the Black Experience in the Americas and Religious Studies Arizona State University. So I'm now handing over to you, Dr. Shamara. Okay, thanks, um, Junaid. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share my work with all of you today. So greetings. Give thanks to the creator and the ancestors for the ability to share my work with all of you. Give thanks to June Reed and everyone who made this gathering possible. Give thanks to Dave Dunkley for organizing this panel and my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Mani Tafara Alma for sharing the space with me. And thank you all for being here uh, this morning. 
My presentation is entitled, Ross the Farwoman's Gender Justice as Guide to Freedom. I advocate this reasoning to Black Madonna who transitioned since this work uh, began. And I'll be mostly talking during this presentation, um, but I do have a, a video clip that I'll play later on in the presentation. As I thought about the title of this conference, Ain't I a Woman, The Black Woman in Historical and Contemporary Context, I cannot help but, think, but recall the Black feminist womanist notion that Black women are not considered women in the white supremacist sense of the term. Black women exist in the realm of alterity and within the context of Black womanhood, some of us exist at the outer limit of the possible. Rastafari women are rendered invisible in Black women's studies, in addition to being erased from white supremacist notions of womanhood. These are the fundamental concerns that animate my broader research agenda, which is to restore the narratives of Rastafari women in Black women's studies and discuss their significance in Pan-African struggle. I share a small part of my work with you today. One, we sat in the outdoor food court at a crawl mall the open air space made for a cool respite from the heat of mid-evening Accra. Sister Beatrice sat across the beige wood table. She drank tea as she spoke about her life and travels. She's originally from Haiti, but studied in France and taught in the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. At the time we met in 2017, she resided in Togo. She learned about Rastafari through culture, the music and the literature, but became Rastafari because of her political ambition. In order to learn more about Rastafari, she wrote her master's thesis entitled Rasta Woman from Myth to Reality, based on the experiences of Rastafari women in Paris during the 1980s. She explained, quote, I guess my political education had come from Haiti, but Rastafari gave me another dimension, which was more like worldwide definition of how a militant can act through culture, unquote. Her desire to live on the continent was driven by her self-identification as a, quote, political Rastafarian, unquote. Her embrace of Rastafari had everything to do with her militant commitment to African unity and locating herself uh, within the Black radical political tradition of Rastafari. Rastafari is a Black Pan-African anti-colonial spiritual movement that began under British colonial rule in 1930s Jamaica to challenge imperialism and racialized oppression of the Black majority population. In a world dominated by a white imperial rule, Rastafari created new discursive frameworks for understanding the self, the community, and the world by deifying Emperor Haile Selassie and Empress Menin Aswa of Ethiopia, creating their own language and valuing their Black African identity. Since Jamaican independence in 1962, Rastafari has become a worldwide cultural and political phenomenon advocating for human rights and environmental justice. Rastafari is often studied as a masculine movement. Many scholars have argued that the movement was established to redeem the Black man. This notion of Rastafari has led to the erasure of women's transformative contributions within the movement and to the dismissal of Rastafari women's activism in Africa and the diaspora. Rooted in 15 years of ethnographic research with Rastafari women and a small group of scholars who have challenged androcentric interpretations of Rastafari, I have found that these women are essential subjects in studies of social and gender justice activism in Africa and the African diaspora. In fact, sister and are central to stretching our thinking around articulations of womanhood and blackness and the ways these identity markers shape what is considered possible for the human experience. Two, Beatrice's militancy indexes a longer history of Rastafari's commitment to Pan-African struggle. Dr. Amani Tafar Alma theorizes the militancy of Rastafari women through the trope of the quote, rebel woman, or someone who understands herself as a part of traditions of freedom, fighting women in opposition to quote, a Babylon system. In England, Julia Sudbury argues Rastafari women create, quote, a new politics, which integrated a Rasta analysis of a Babylon system with Black women's experiences of gender depression to create a new and unique oppositional vision, unquote. The integrated critique of the imperialist, capitalist, patriarchal, white supremacist world order, combined with the experience of being Africa-centered Black women, allows Rastafari women to create Black rebel women spaces rife for strategizing how to complete the task of emancipation. 
The rebel women spaces that Sistrin create continue in this freedom fighting tradition of African and African diaspora women by dismantling sexism, racism, classism through their liberty because they redefine normative understandings of gender, engage in anti-colonial work, and reclaim space even in the face of white supremacy. So white supremacy. The term liberty is a Rastafari word denoting the lived philosophy guiding everyday anti-colonial practices of sister and brethren. Rastafari women critique the ways white imperial rule used Christianity and racial capitalism to develop gender constructs that valued nuclear families over extended kinship networks and gendered the private and public space, which led to women's relegation to the, dom to the domestic sphere. According to Jeanne Christensen, Rasta womanism challenges the oppression of women by critiquing the ways plantation and colonial society employ gender norms to limit the mobility and choices of women. In order to dismantle this sexism, Rastafari women develop their own theorizations of balance between masculine and feminine energies within the body. Christensen writes, Rasta, quote, Rastafari feminists understand feminine and masculine as ways of conceptualizing energy that ought not to be conflated with the male and female bodies." Unquote. Some Rastafari women refuse to concretize gender as only rooted in bioanatomical sex and challenge imperial prescribed gender roles. In 2008, Black Madonna, a Rastafari woman who repatriated to Ghana from Jamaica, questioned how a man could understand a woman outside of himself when he didn't understand the woman inside of himself. She thought it was critical that every person understand the masculine and feminine aspects of their character. With this said, I do agree with Dr. Tafari Alma's contention that Rastafari women exist upon a rebel woman continuum, with some ascribing to forms of traditional gender notions and others ascribing to balanced gendered energies. Challenging sexism by reformulating their understandings of gender is a critical contribution of Rastafari women's thought. Prior to Jeanne Christensen's development of Rasta womanism, Teresa Turner identified two strands that characterize the Rastafari movement. The quote, old Rastafari, which is rooted in sexism and male dominance, and the quote, new Rastafari, which is rooted in Rasta feminism. Turner defined Rasta feminism as an ideology and practice that dismantles capitalism, fights for land rights, and unites with anti-colonial struggles in continental Africa, specifically the Mau Mau struggle against British colonialism. Turner's formulation of the new Rastafari documents the historic nature of Rastafari women's transnational contributions to Pan-African work. Julius, Julia Sudbury and Ashita Dwyer underscore the transnational nature of the Black womanist spaces Rastafari women create by combining their Rastafari Pan-African stance with their gender justice critiques. All these authors point to a unique epistemological thread that comprises the consciousness or world sense that women within the movement employ through their liberty. Three, in order to document Sistrin's contributions, Sister Beatrice chose to write. Excuse me, um, Dr. Shamara. Can the person please ensure they mute because you're interfering with the conference? Can everybody please mute? Excuse me, please. Can everybody please ensure they're on mute? You have just disturbed a really important conference contributor. Carry on, my sister. I apologize for that thoughtless behavior. Oh, no worries, no worries, thank you. Um, in order to document Sistrin's contributions, Sister Beatrice chose to write about Rastafari women's experiences in her thesis that I mentioned earlier, From Myth to Reality. When I asked her why she wanted to write her thesis on Sistrin, she said, quote, to me, Rasta women were totally invisible. Uh, the, unquote, the erasure of, cis, of Rastafari women from English and French literature led Beatrice to write her unpublished thesis in the 1980s. Beatrice's work helped her personally embrace the, quote, militancy of Rastafari women she worked with and contributed enduring truths that still hold today. I'll play a clip from an interview with Sister Beatrice where she discusses her uh, research findings. I'm just going to try to share my screen. There was not a lot of documentation. There was a lot of, uh, well, political documentation on, well, Marcus Garvey on the, and different figures of the Rastafari movement. So, um, yeah, I guess it helped me 
better um, embrace the militancy of these women. Uh, what I discovered was, um, well, of course, just a validation that they existed and they were doing uh, wonderful things that some preferred for religious reasons or the question of faith and um, to be, you know, uh, not to be shown in the limelight, but thought that, you know, their militancy had to be discreet. Um, the loyalty of uh, the woman to her brother, um, the, the idea that uh, they are very um, strong defenders of the black unity to family, um, but that their role uh, is greater than um, just being the sister and the queen at home. I mean, you're queen. You're a queen at home. Yes, you're a queen. You're, um, you know, you take care of the, of the household. You have your children. You raise your kids, and we all know that it's it's a full time responsibility and job. And but many many women also also work. Uh, also because of uh, their being um, Rastafarian women and. Uh, showing it or showcasing it uh, like an example for others in public life. So you have teachers, you have doctors, you have nurses, you have, uh, you have singers, artists in all domains of arts. Uh, you have politicians, you have people in the, even in the armed forces, well, I mean, women who, well, grow their locks and somehow are identified as Rastafari, but that kind of political or militant um, militancy in Rastafari that I really find interesting because it's super important to have models, role models. And if as a young woman, you see other young women or uh, elderly sisters, uh, you know, growing their locks, putting their locks and just living their lives uh, and being totally, you know, balanced and uh, aware of, uh, you know, what they're doing, you just, you just feel like you're empowered as well to do the same. Not only were Rastafari women leading by embracing and loving themselves, they were they empowered others like Beatrice, Sister Beatrice to embrace herself. The transcendent nature of Rastafari women's liberty is the core of their unique form of freedom. By defining freedom as the recovery of self and community from Christian white supremacist racial capitalist patriarchy and fighting for justice, we then begin to articulate a navigational compass for Sistrin's rebel woman freedom fighting tradition. Although Beatrice's thesis has joined the canon of unpublished or lost work that Rastafari women have produced over the years, it underscores women's desire to be documented as contributing partners in the evolution of the movement and highlights the transnational nature of their lived realities because the work was produced in Paris by a Haitian Rastafari woman who lived in multiple geopolitical spaces. Four. I met Sister Beatrice on her first trip to Ghana. She planned an activism event, which combines art and activism. Activism is a conceptual framework for organizing groups of artists to use their artwork to educate communities around West Africa about different Pan-African figures. The event she planned in Accra united music, fashion, spoken word, and guest speakers like Rastafari and Empress Sonia Lifebook to think about repatriation to Ghana. Beatrice is just one example of the many Rastafari women who are doing similar Pan-African work in Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, Canada, the Americas, and South America, but are not highlighted in the literature. Rastafari women's ideas and community work are central to forming new intellectual archives, transgressing epistemic barriers between diaspora and African studies, diversifying the, the groups of Black women that scholars write about when they consider Black women's organizing and are foundational for thinking about future contours of freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shamara. That was a very fascinating talk. Before I jump in with any questions, questions. Um, can I ask people to put any questions to Dr. Shamara in our chat, please? I'm sure there are people out there with some burning questions. And Juanita, you're helping me. I know you're there. Do 
question. I'm just unmuting. Can we have all of the panelists first and have the questions at the end? No problem. No thank problem. You. Bless you. Um, and thank you, um, Dr. Shamara. We'll come to you at the end. All right. So we're now moving on to Dr. Tafari Amma. She is a research fellow at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies Regional Coordinating Office at the University of Westminster. And her talk will be is entitled Towards Toward a Project of Transnational Justice, Rastafari Womanist Epistemology. Thank you. And handing over to you, Dr. Imani. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be part of this panel today. And um think it's very much of a worthwhile endeavor to interrogate the things that we consider so normal. I will share my screen and start this PowerPoint from the beginning. Okay, so as you know how these things go, I had a bit of a tweak of the title as I started along. And so this is the title that I'm working with today, Ain't I a Woman, Rastafari, Womanism and Decolonizing Identity Politics. Because pretty much that's what the Rastafari um, identity politics provide us with a framework to do. So in 2004, I was interviewed by Ian Boyne of Blessed Memory for his popular television show profile. And I was almost floored when he asked, how could such an intelligent woman like you be a Rastafari woman? And I had to just recover myself in time to say, how could such uh, an intelligent man like you be a Christian, because of course you know how these normative uh, assumptions work. I figured that the sparring captured the stereotypes that have long prevailed in Jamaica about Rastafari. Rastafari are portrayed as insane, as dirty, as socially undesirable, and therefore unworthy of their inalienable human rights. So this mechanism of cognitive dissonance is a colonial uh, mechanism in its roots and in its political applications. And I have found that projecting stereotypes onto um, people who are disadvantaged like Rastafari serves to undervalue members of the liberty and um, provide a, a negative framework within which to look at blackness and Pan-Africanness as um, Rastafari have uh, upheld them as negative um, practices and negative identity markers. So this assumption of ma madness has been deployed with very Foucauldian um, uh, resoundingness as power mechanisms to deny Rastafari their access to as I said, they're inalienable human rights, like housing, like education, like employment, like access to academic legitimacy. And ever since the formation of Rastafari as a social resistance liberty or a way of life, that started in Jamaica in the 1930s. These stereotypes have abounded and has, have result, resulted in criminalization and um, terrorization of members of the Liberty. You could even look at these images to see how Jamaica has corresponded to the colonial uh, uh, symbol of the British flag in the reproduction of its own national identity. And the stereotyping of Rastafari is also captured in this image um, of this man. And this I am maintaining is a racialized, um, projection that serves to also uh, project Rastafari as sexualized um, enamors of, of sex tourists who ply the North Coast or used to do so before um, the onset of COVID-19 in greater numbers. So the redemptive representation of Rastafari is of course the correspondence of 
Emperor Haile Selassie and Empress Menon asked for in this image of their coronation in 1930, November 2nd, which of course is an anniversary that is imminent on the calendar coming up. And in this presentation, what I'm trying to do is use the model of the double consciousness of entire woman um, that was articulated by Sojourner Truth to invoke the um, <laughs> rights of women and, and uh, to deconstruct patriarchy and racialized notions of identity politics in that epic speech she made in 1851. I'm using it to think through the ontological and embodied implications of the experiences of exclusion and marginalization that Rastafari in general and Rastafari women in particular continue to navigate both in the academic environment and in the wider society. I'm proposing that the entire woman rhetorical question is an intentionally twisted trope designed to ransack notions of normalcy and reveal the prejudices posing as the proverbial elephants in the room where power resides, but not is not often, of course, spoken about the power that would allow a popular journalist to assume that it, it was an okay as different from Rastafari in general, who may not converse in the colonial language without him realizing that, of course, that is a choice that is a deliberate form of resistance. Um, so the, this uh, redemption of Rastafari also provides uh, fodder for, for studies to abound about what the liberty or way of life of Rastafari actually is actually constituted of. And the um, liberty was actually showcased in, in this very extraordinary exhibition by the um, Smithsonian Institute which decided that in their own lifetime, Rastafari should be commemorated for creating an alternative sensibility of identity politics that um, counter uh, uh, discourse the prevailing colonial norms. So when, when Sojourner Truth explained so inimitably what her definition of womanism was, she was actually providing us in the African diaspora with a model for excavating um, our experiences of resistance from except intersectional circumstances of domination, of oppression, of exploitation. She was bearing witness to the hybrid model of analysis that has to be applied to an explanation of the phrasing, the personal is political. She invites us to tell our truths from an embodied and experiential perspective, her deconstruction of normative notions of masculinity and femininity reveals the binary oppositions that feed stereotypes that only serve to dehumanize us. Um, the characterizations that she provided us enable those identified as the primary opposite factor to enjoy advantage relative to those considered secondary, if considered at all. So she really enables us to uh, critically analyze, provides a critical pedagogy that Paula Freire talks about um, when she declared without apology that events that happen in the so-called private sphere have public consequence, that what happens in the secret places of the household or else in the peripheralized places on plantations matter to the structures of power that bolster the, the public sphere. So Journal called out the elephants in the room, pointing out everyday ways that black women, indigenous women, and women of color have long been exercising agency, breaking silences, contesting marginalizations and exclusions, and coming to voice and visibilization. These responses are in resistance, of course, against the multiple factors of disadvantage that prevent the socially excluded, uh, marginalized and oppressed, especially black women from realizing their full potential. So speaking of the personal being political, I cited up Rastafari 
or became aware of Rastafari in my early 20s, many, many years ago. And that provided a self-identity model to counteract the negative stereotypes of African people pre present in the Jamaican popular culture. Embracing Rastafari resulted in a change of my worldview, a change of my appearance, and also a self-renaming as resistance to the enduring shackling of identity as African identity in the diaspora to European monikers and symbolisms. Once inside the liberty of Rastafari though, I quickly realized that although I was resisting the mainstream unconsciousness of the society, the society was intent on pushing back with racialized and class loaded stereotypes and exclusions. It has been quite a journey to self uh, actualization that this has um, taught me. So within Rastafari, what I was chagrined to realize was that the rampant patriarchy that um, permeates the wider society is also reflecting in perceptions of gender power relations uh, that to my mind um, was counter intuitive, counter active to the coronation of Haile Selassie and Empress Menem. So the response that Rastafari women have had to create was to, to create a definition of womanism that correlates with what um, Sojourner Truth had to offer us and which reinstates the idealization of Empress Menen as for the Queen Omega to Haile Selassie's representation of King Alpha um, to idealize her for the epic role that she played uh, for nearly four decades as the royal couple um, reigned supreme in and out of Ethiopia. Queen Empress Menen promoted education as a means for women to leverage leadership roles in public and private spheres for empowerment. And as a governance strategy, she ensured that policy and practice demonstrated uh, consistent gender and development responsiveness. And taking the energy of Sojourner Truth a foot further, it surprised winning author Alice Walker um, and joined us to uh, look to our womanist fem or feminist principles in our own image because she said uh, lavender is to womanist sorry is to feminist as purple is to lavender as a symbolic way of distinguishing black women's advocacy for liberation and equality from the white suffragist and feminist movements. Womanism therefore encompasses responses to the intersectionalities of race, class, and gender oppressions that are inscribed on the black, especially female body by institutions of socialization. And this results of course in the taken for granted uh, Jamaican proverb, which asserts anything to black no good. So Emperor Haile Selassie and Empress Menen embody that counter narrative that Rastafari have devised to look to God in our own image and in our own likeness in counter um, narrative to the prevailing white male patriarchal Eurocentric racialized image. Womanists therefore suggest that black women's experiences must be examined to determine the sites of their oppression and also their liberation. And these experiences should inform the strategies of resistance that craft that we craft to remain capable of playing um, our roles in our everyday lives. In order to navigate the minefield of uh, the differences that prevent us from regaining our full humanity, the humanity that Sojourner Truth wanted to excavate, excavate with her entire woman speech, she, we have to uh, now devise as Rastafari women, as black women, as women of color in general, um, new platforms for struggling for gender 
equality realization. And therefore, by appropriating the, even the pejorative designation of woman and creating a concept of womanism, Black scholars and activists have imbued womanism with the depth of meanings connoted by Alice Walker's purpling procedure, conceptualizing their experiences as knowledge and providing safe spaces to say what they know. Women of color have exercised agency and power over the meanings to be ascribed to their lives and their representation. So finally, a Rastafari womanist perspective is therefore compatible with the emancipatory processes without which the mental liberation of which Marcus Garvey alludes to will remain elusive. And this critical compass will, on the other hand, provide us with the leverage of indigenous knowledges to reinstate our epistemic authority and provide uh, legitimacy for those knowledges that have been discarded and undervalued for too long. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Sorry. Um, oh, for some reason I'm getting feedback. I'm not sure why. Can somebody technical? Oh, bless you. Someone technical has helped me out. Um, Dr. Tafari, Emma, that was wonderful. And I'm sure we'll get some really amazing questions. But I, I have to correct myself because Brother Augustino told me that I put you in the University of Westminster. And I might love to have you here, but actually you're based at the University of the West Indies. So I <laughs> sit corrected. Um, last but definitely not least is um, my next panelist. And I'm going to guess that your name, Dr. Dave, Davey is Davy Dunkley, who's the Associate Professor in the Department of Black Studies at the University of Missouri. And Davy's title is The Womanist Ideology of Miriam Lennox in Early Rastafari. So I'm handing over to Dr. Davy and asking that the spotlight be put on him now. Thank you so much and welcome, Dr. Davy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And um, thank you to everyone for all the organizers for organizing this very interesting um, and uplifting conference. And I just want to say thank you to my fellow panelists for agreeing to um, be on this panel um, about Rastafari, both in its present and um, past forms. I, you know, my presentation is, is, is very much linked to um, Shamara's and, and Imani's in the sense that I'm going to take up the mantle of discussing womanist, um, the womanist um, ideology, and in this case, womanist theology in the thinking of Miriam Lennox, who is one of the, one of the early Rastafari women. But before I go into Lennox, I'm going to share um, just a little, a few slides with you to kind of show you where this work is coming from and just talk a little bit about the um about the work itself. So let me let me share the screen. Okay. So the the title of the, the talk is really the womanist theology of Miriam Lennox in early Rastafari. And um, it it it's part it's it's part of a larger work that I have been doing on early Rastafari women. The 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 most um, prominent women in that study are are featured here. They are my, by no means the only women in the study, but the, the there are chapters in the in the study that really revolve around their their experiences and what they had to say about life for women and men and children in the early Rastafari movement. And when I say early, I mean the, the, from the beginning of the, 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 the movement, the apparent genesis in the early 1930s up to the independence, the political independence of Jamaica in 1962. And um, as you all know, the, the Rastafari was, well, the birthplace of Rastafari was Jamaica. 
Um, it is by no means the only place you can find Rastafari. Today, I saw in the chat somebody asking about Rastafari in Britain. Yes, the population there is still very strong. And it's all over the world, um, in, the, in, in East Asia, Central Asia, and all over the Americas. And there's a very large group of Rastafari people in, in South Africa. Um, so the, um, the woman here, Miriam Lennox, uh, um, is, on the, is on your left at the bottom. Then just above her is, is Edna Fisher. And in the middle is, is Sister um, Audrey. And um, on, the, on the right is, is, is Tenet Bent, who was married to the, one of the uh, most, um, well, arguably the most prominent of the founders of Rastafari, Leonard, Leonard Howell. Some of the, 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 the um, important activities of women during the early period was to organize education. And um, a lot of that came out of viewing the, the, the education system under the colonial government because Jamaica at the time was still very much a, a colony of Britain. In fact, it was, it was more so a colony of Britain than at any point in its, in its past, even during slavery, because at this period, it was under Crown Colony government, direct rule from London. Um, which had ended with the um, after the Murabi, which had started after the Murabi Rebellion, when Britain decided to double down on controlling the colonies directly because of the to avoid any future um, unrest um, or insurrection by the black um, black majority. So, so the education system, the, the women recognized the the the, 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 the um, failures of the education system, particularly as it related to black children and decided to prioritize that in the earliest communities. Um, um, these, de these pictures depict the, the um, schools that were organized at Pinnacle, which is where Tenet Bent um, taught, and as well as the um, school organized, the Ethiopian school organized by Edna Fisher, which you see depicted in the more modern looking um, pictures. This is um, the earliest um, construction of the compound that Fisher had, had um, started with, with the man who subsequently became her husband with, um, and Claudius Henry, who is um, known for, for other activities because he was actually tried for treason in, in 1960, along with Fisher as well. So now we get to um, Sister Miriam Lennox, and um, she um, was born um, in 1915, and she um, transitioned in 1995. So she lived about um, 80 years or so. And the, the book in which um, I discuss all of these women is is actually it's it's actually just published. It's Women and Resistance in the Early Rastafari Movement. So um, the, the the, the picture you see here with Miriam, she is, is was taken in Kingston in 19, um, uh, 1983. And I should credit the, um, it's, it's, it's provided courtesy of the, um, Jake Homiak at the International Rastafari Archives Project at the National um, Anthropological Archives at the Smithsonian. And that, that archive has been very useful in, in helping me to reconstruct the history of, of um, women in the early Rastafari movement. I want to say um, um, just briefly that women, we, we, we believed that women were um, sort of dormant, um, docile during the early period. I saw this coming out a lot in the, in the literature that they were silent, that they were just following the men in the movement. And I, I said, but how can this be having um, witness the, 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 the history of women's activism before that in during the Murabi rebellion itself and even before that during slavery. So when I started looking at it, I realized that a lot of this conversation about women's docility and, and, uh, and silence was actually silencing and a lot of it was colonial epistemology as well. This, this, I, this idea that if, if the colonial government believed that if they sidelined women in the early movement, then it would, and it would help to engineer the, 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 the outcast status of Rastafari that they were hoping for. So in other words, they, they made it into this sort of patriarchal movement, um, viciously patriarchal, as a way to also undermine it. But women were among the first adherents of the Rastafari movement, and indeed among the first political activists. So um, what I want to say about Miriam is that 
she um since the establishment of Rastafari, it has experienced notable um, changes that have resulted in myriad interpretations of the connection between its doctrine and Christianity. And um, such interpretations led to the development of different missions or, or, or missionary organs or mansions, as they are now called, within the movement, notably the Howellites, Nyabengi, Babashante, and the 12 tribes. Um, and they all developed independently of each other. But early Rastafari women like, uh, like Miriam Lennox also interpreted Christianity to empower themselves. Lennox's reasoning on women, especially Empress Menen as far of Ethiopia, was essentially guided by the Bible. Um, in 1930, as you heard, Wazero Manan was crowned Empress Menin of Ethiopia alongside her husband, who was crowned the um, Emperor Haile Selassie I. But Lennox used her biblical interpretations of the role of Empress Menin to stimulate doctrinal change that helped to reduce patriarchy in the movement. Uh, so though early women did not use terms like womanist to describe themselves, they exuded characteristics of what we have become who have come to define as womanism today. And the, the fact that womanism still remains a sort of developing tradition also indicates its likely um, presence from before the term was coined in the mid 1980s by black women writers in the US, namely Alice Walker that I um, mentioned. And the, the, the early Rastafari women used the, 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 their um, womanist um, interpretation of the Bible to, to extend the Black liberation movement to include women's resistance to intersected oppressions of sexism, racism, classism, and also neocolonialism. Um, womanist theology itself specified that Black women had the right to criticize theological knowledge and interpret scripture through their African-oriented lenses. In other words, it's focused on women's voices and experiences of the, of the faith, in this case, the Rastafari faith, rather than anything said or decided by, decided by men, promoted Black and African-centered women's freedom of will and their mature intellect. Lennox's, um, Lennox's uh, religious work um, showed that womanism had manifested in the early years of the movement, um, women who joined the movement that's before the political independence of Jamaica in 1962. And much of this womanist um, discourse of early women was inherited by the um, subsequent women who subsequently joined the movement because they spoke to each other, they had gen intergenerational conversations and developed highly, var highly variable views of gender as it has been called and um, ideas about gender equality. Um, Lennox herself was in her 20s when she began to move towards this pro-woman um, consciousness within Rastafari um, and began to speak to other women and men about women's roles. She also read very widely one of the, um, one of the, it, one of the people she read a lot was um, Sylvia Pankers, who should be no um, stranger to, to, to a, a lot of people in, in Britain, the British suffragist and communist who was actually in Ethiopia when it was um, when the invasion by Italy took place. And she also read um, Amy Bailey, the Garveyite and feminist who was writing in the 1940s and, and, and having discussions about women, how women, men believe women must follow them and, and they should be always standing behind men. So, so, so Lennox was developing her ideas from her re wide reading um, inside the Bible, outside the Bible and having discussions within the movement based on her reading. And um, when she was interviewed in 1983, this is, this is, this is what she, she, in reflecting on those years, this is some of what she said. She said that, in her own journey as a person of faith, um, she started in the church, but then she realized that she she understand she understood that the message of King James, that is the Bible, was written in I and I, and for and the half has never been told. And then she went on to say that that half that has never been told meant that she herself and other women knew a lot more, and including differences 
in interpreting and understanding the, the Bible, what it meant for men and what it meant, meant for women. They, 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 she also helped to create some leadership, um, some social groups within the movement, early movement, to balance the status quo of male leadership and use the association with other women to boost the morale of women there and to establish their authority on doctrine and, of course, the history of the movement. Now, she was very instrumental in challenging some of what the prominent male members at the time um, had to say, including Leonard Howell. Um, she, one, one counteraction was that the Messiah manifested himself um, in, in Africa, no other place, whereas for Howell, it was, it was in the, um, what we refer to as the Middle East today. Um, she also challenged Samuel Brown on race um, by stating that, because um, Samuel Brown had established this idea that, you know, the God of the black man is different from the God of the white man, and Miriam um, quite um, pointedly said, no, that's wrong. She said, quote, whether you're black, whether you're pink, whether you're red, whether you're white, it is one man who is God, and it is Jarastafari, and not another son, unquote. So, so Lennox was, was, was pretty active during the, the early period. And um, after the independence of Jamaica, she kind of relinquished some of that mantle to a, a younger generation of women and quite, 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 and, and I'm not surprised that happened because that is pretty much the story of, of, of um, a lot of the early women of the movement. And also what it did was to help to, to um, validate some of the impressions that they were silent or they weren't doing anything but by, at that point they had done a lot and they expected the future generation the younger generation to continue the work so uh, to conclude um becoming rastafari in the early period signified that for women that they were their empowerment to make decisions for themselves about their future, about their children, about their male partners. And a lot of these women were, they came into the movement independently of their male, male, male partners. Some of them came in with their um, as single parents and some of them also dragged the men into the movement, um, recognizing that it could help to, to um, em empower them in terms of their struggle against um, colonial poverty. Uh, I think I, 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 can, I can stop there. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dave. That was amazing. That was so great. And um, um, if people want to take notes of your, your, is this your latest book, Dave? Yes. Yes, because I'm searching for it and I um, couldn't find it in that company that I can't mention their name but they begin with A and end in N. Um, but um, I'm sure many of us will um, go out and get that book and also look for publications by your uh, fellow uh, panelists, Dr. Shamara Al-Hassan and Dr. Tafari Amma. So now we'll go with my with assistance from either Elizabeth or Angelina. I'm going to, um, um, they're going to help me with um, questions that we've got in the chat. Please, if you haven't posted a question yet for any of our three panelists, please, please, please post your questions now. And do we have our first uh, question, either Angelina or um, or Elizabeth, please? Yes. yes. Hello. Um, oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, thanks, Elizabeth. I noted the first question was from um, uh, Ifemu Umari Weber, who asked, uh, how strong, to Dr. Shamara, how strong is the Rastafarian communities in Britain? Uh, saying that there was a high profile in the 1980s, but not so, not so now. Um, so, uh, Dr. Shamara, how would you respond to that question? Well, Kim, thanks for the question. I think Dave uh, offered a, a response um, at the beginning of his presentation to say that the Rastafari population in uh, the UK is actually one of the central uh, Rastafari populations that there is and it's still going strong. Um, and I just wanted to extend his response um, by saying that in my presentation, although I work on the Caribbean and continental Africa for the most part, um, there is a, a woman who uh, does a lot of uh, community work 
documenting the history of Rastafari women in the UK, and her name is Alima Gray. So I'd encourage you to check out her work. Um, and then the person that I cited in my paper um, to talk about uh, Rastafari women is uh, Julia Sudbury. Um, and she wrote a book called uh, other kinds of dreams about Black women's organizations um, in the UK, where she does talk about Rastafari women's organizing, and that was published in 1998. So those are some resources um, to look up more about the Rastafari community in Britain. Thank you, Shamara. Do we have another question for our panelists, please? Yeah, I also noted that um, it's not um, not sure it's pertinent to the presentation that was that uh, Dr. Dunkley did, but um, Agostino Punic wanted to know if Claudius Henry uh, was charged with treason. Yes, um, but he was not the only one, and the the this this, this it is pertinent, uh, Angelina, and I'll tell you why because there were 13, um, there were 14 people charged for um, treason felony in 1960, which was the, 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 the most serious crime you could commit, could be charged for against the government, right? And um, one, of, one of those, two of those persons were women. One was, was, um, was Edna Fisher, who was the co-founder of the, the, what becomes known as the Henry movement but it actually started out as, as, the, the, as the Edna Fisher movement, because what Henry did in the, in the mid 1950s was to link up with Fisher who had started a women's group, a women's group in her, in, on, on her property in St. Andrew, in her house. And these were all women who were part of the Rastafari movement. They were also um, Garveyite women. And the number I found was about 30 or so of them formed the core of the women's circle. And Henry joined forces with them and together with Fisher, they built this, this church, this, this Rastafari movement, which, which becomes very prominent. And then in, the in 1960, after police investigations, they, were, they, they found um, weapons and so on in the, com in the compound. Um, there is a whole other side to this story about whether what, what weapons were for and so on. But Trisha was also charged and she was she got three years, but because of the government's focus on Henry and getting Henry, and this is part of the androcentrism of colonial, how the colonial system operated, because the story that it told was that men were, were um, encouraging women to do all these things and women had no agency in the matter. So Henry gets 10 years for Patrice felony, Fisher gets three. But what did she do after, she was actually happy because what after three years, coming out of three years, she resuscitated the movement and was running the whole thing before Henry even came out of, come out of prison. So she was the anchor for that movement, right? Henry may have been the, the preacher, Right, but 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 um, certainly Edna Fisher was the chief organizer and manager. Thank you, Davey. Yeah, I see we have some more questions coming through. I just made a note of one. It's just, it's a question for you um, again, Dr. Dunkley. It's when Miriam Miriam engaged with Amy Bailey. Did she ever write in the newspapers? No, Miriam. Is, is, is talking about all of this stuff in, in her interviews with anthropologists. So she was interviewed by Carl Yarni, she was interviewed by um, um, Rene Romano and Elliot Lieb in, in the 1970s and in the 1980s. So she's reflecting on her ex experiences. There, is, there are hours of, of interviews at the Smithsonian. Um, it, it, when I say always, I mean a lot, and it's on video. So you can see her and so on, and she's talking about the, the history in, in retrospect, and this, you know, remembering, reading all of this stuff. She, 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 she read very widely. She was reading literature coming out of the early Adventist church and complaining about um, Peterson, for example, the black Adventist in, in America, who recognized 
recognized that there was something special going on in Ethiopia, um, who asked for permission from the Ethiopian kingdom to establish an Adventist church there, got the, 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 the permission, but yet failed to recognize the, 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 um, the, that the emperor represented the, the, the uh, so-called second coming of, of, of the Christ. So uh, all of this is Miriam, because what Miriam did was to go out and preach. She was actually on the streets preaching, at a, especially at a time when they thought that only men were preaching, right? So no, she did not um, document this stuff, but she, it, it is in the interviews that she did. Thank you so very much for such a full and comprehensive answer to that question, Dr. Dunkley. Um, I can't see if there, that there are any other questions, if anybody else has any questions for this panel, this amazing panel that we just had, um, now's the opportunity to do so. If there aren't any more questions, and I'm just going to prompt and not necessarily make this decision, I'm going to suggest that um, we go to our break. It will be a, um, if we go now, if there are no more questions, it will be a strict nine minute break to allow panel three that will be moderated by Rita Gale to start. Um, but can I just canvas for some more questions because we've had, as Angelina said, three excellent um, panelists, and we want to um, ask as many questions while we've got them here. This is a great opportunity. Questions popped up, um, June. Uh, it's asking the panelists, it's, it seems to be a general question, how have the panelists resisted influence from male editorial influence? That's a big question. <laughs> I, you know, <clears throat> oh boy, Sh Shamar and I, man, you want, you want to um, get, get going on this one because I have a, I have like a, you know, a, I could write a book on this one. I'm, sh I'm, sh I have no doubt of that. Let, um, please, if you can uh, make a contribution, that would be terrific. So let's hear what you have to say. First of all, when I, I started working on Rastafari, in the, um, I think it was about, um, I just come back from work and it was, I was working at the University of West Indies. It was about 20, 2009. I was, I was told that this isn't legitimate history, basically, you know? And it got even worse when I started working on Rastafari women. They were asking me, what, what, what women? I mean, they were all millions of the men. The men dragged them into this thing and corrupted them and so on. So it was a real, it was, it was a real struggle to, to sort of find a, um, a way to have this conversation within the broader history of Jamaica and the history of the Black Atlantic world. Um, fortunately, there were um, there were people who recognized the value of, of the work. A um, um, good deal of anthropologists, you know, Jay Komiak was one of them. Um, Imani had done some 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 significant work, and then we had people. We had the Rastafari Studies um, Initiative at the university at the time, which also helped. But mainstream history in the in the Caribbean had been ignoring Rastafari for a long time. You know, the, the very few historians had taken up work, on, had done work on it. Robert Hill was one of them, Horace Campbell was another one. And then you found snippets of it in Walter Rodney's work, but then, you know, Rodney, you know, is off the scene by the, by the early 1980s. So it, it, it was a real, real struggle. Um, but now, now that there, there is recognition that you know, an acknowledgement that these stories need to be told and they are not just this history of Rastafari, but the history, a significant part of the history of the Caribbean and the, the Black Atlantic, because some of the, you know, many of the, the, the themes that we explore, resistance, oppression, colonialism, decolonization, these are all big topics within the history of the African diaspora. So um, I'm happy to see that the changes have, have, have occurred. So thank you, Dr. Dave, 
and thank you to Dr. Shamara and Dr. Imani. We're now going to go into a five minute comfort break, five minutes. So please do return because we've got our final panel coming up. And um, 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 and also equally as importantly, we've got um, our keynote speaker, Professor Olivet Ottili. So there's lots of more rich presenters coming forward. So we're going to take a short break now. Please return promptly at 10 minutes past, sorry, at um, at 15 minutes past four. Thank you very much for my panellists once again, to the panellists from um, panel one, and for you all for joining us this afternoon. So do remain seated and strapped to your chairs, except if you need to escape for your loo break. Bless up Dr. Dave, Dr. Shamara and Dr. Imani. Hi, Angela, Angelina, good afternoon. Hello, hello, I was just running to the loo, hello. Hi. <laughs> hey, hi, good afternoon. Hello. Hey. I'm, I'm here, I'm here, hi. Hi. So, I don't know if you heard that. Um, there, there's a comfort break, is that right? That's, That's right. right, yeah. Back at quarter past, um, and I'll be monitoring the chat for you. Lovely, thank you. I'm just going to um, post something in the chat. Would you like me to? Would you like me to capture them and send the questions to you directly, or would you just like me to read it out um, as we go along? Um, the practice has been so far to let all of the speakers speak first and then yeah. capture the questions at the end. Yes. But do you want me to just to go through the script? and relay the questions or do you want me actually to capture them and send them to yeah, you? Yeah, we'll capture them, we'll do it at the end, yeah. Right, okay, but I, I'll go through them at the end. I, I won't just send, yeah, okay. Oh yes, please, yeah, that'd be better, yeah, thank you. See you soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
Sorry, bear with me a second. I'm just trying to load the presentation. Um, is everybody able to see that now? Uh, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. First of all, we would like to thank the organisers um, for accepting us to present today. We are very thankful for the opportunity to present our presentation as first year PhD students. We look forward to sharing our perspectives as well as engaging in a fruitful discussion as we present Jasmine Sullivan's Host Tales, Black Women Owning Sexual Agency. Good afternoon, my name is Natasha. I'm a PhD student and a GTA at the University of Leicester. My PhD looks at fashion publishing and the future of racism. I'm an independent collector, archivist, researcher, writer, and founder of two digital social platforms called Black Cover Archive and Black British Books. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rihanna Raymond Williams. I'm a writer, researcher, and social entrepreneur from East London. And my PhD aims to explore how Black women in the UK make sense of their sexual identity. In terms of today's presentation, we're giving you a brief context of how the presentation will um, flow. First of all, we'll be talking about the album, which is uh, the album is everything, giving you an overview of the album and the importance and significance of what it demonstrates. We'll then be shining the light on silent voices, particularly looking at how black female bodies have been historically presented. We'll then talk a bit about the spoken words and interludes featured on the album, um, and particularly talk about the thematic analysis of Antoinette's tale. And then lastly, we'll end the presentation by talking about or thinking about what about the experiences of black British women in the UK. Um, just in terms of the content for the presentation, we understand that some of the content featured might be received as offensive or distressing. However, it's been included for the purpose of discussion as part of our presentation. Um, I'm hoping this shares, but if not, I'll go back out and... Can people hear the sound on this? No. Okay. Let me bear with me a second. I think I need to stop sharing and reshare, so bear with me. Um, it's just that I need to click something when you share something. Click share sound. Yeah, that's the one. Bear with me. Okay, so let me just start that from the beginning. Are we able to hear that now? Yes. Our hotel to give voice to everyone. We're deserving of respect whether we work as CEO at a company or if we strip it. It's about unity. It's about boldness. It's about ownership and confidence. And also vulnerability and reflection. It's about a woman deciding how she wants to present herself to the world and not being told or influenced by anyone but her goddamn self. It's about women writing their own imperfect stories unashamed. Its album is Everything is an introduction to the significance of the album. Hose Tales was released on the 8th of January, 2021. The EP album gives the everyday woman agency over their life, love and sex experiences through spoken words and interludes. The album also challenges the idea on how black women must act and present themselves. It gives authority to the black woman to share their personal experiences without feeling ashamed. The album impacted not just music lovers, but those who were outside of that realm. Candice Benbow, a multi-genre theologian, created a chat room on the 9th of January, 2021, to discuss the album on Clubhouse with 500 females sharing their stories of real joy, sex, pain, and deep heartache. Issa Rae, an actress, writer, and producer, exchanged tweets with Sutherland, alluding to a host tale short film being produced. The question is, why did this album impact women to the point of a clubhouse discussion, the potential of a short film, and us writing a paper on this topic? So now we're gonna talk about the historical presentation, oh, sorry, historical presentation of black women's bodies. 
Black women's voices and their experiences of their bodies have continued to be silenced due to the combination of patriarchy, racism, and socioeconomic factors. Often the narratives surrounding black women and their bodies have been portrayed as hypersexual, promiscuous, and sexually dominant, often resulting in a need for them to be controlled. Visual depictions of black women and girls with large breasts and bottoms are often present in hip hop music videos. Despite the music and lyrics potentially not having any relation to the women in the videos, their bodies are presented to create the idea of sexual availability and commodification. The earliest idea of controlling the black women's voice over their bodies can be pinpointed to the legacy of Sajati Bartman of the 19th century, also known as Hot and Top Venus, who was one of the first examples of the human zoo. Sajati was paraded around as though she was a theme park attraction in Piccadilly in central London. Her identity was stripped and her voice was silenced while she would be poked, prodded and teased for having a big bottom. After her death, she was dissected and partially preserved without consent. This is an example of how black bodies have been trafficked, exploited for monetary gain and unethically experimented on for the purpose of medical advancement, thereby leaving black women without a voice and agency over their bodies. Misogynoir, a term coined by African-American feminist scholar Moya Bailey, refers to the specific hatred, dislike, distrust, and prejudice directed towards Black women. Assumptions are made about Black women, who they are, and through, stereotype, and through stereotypes that continue to leave Black women feeling unsafe and unsupported and ultimately unheard. For example, the mammy who is, every, who is a caregiver to everybody but herself, the Jezebel who is highly promiscuous and sexually available, the angry black woman who is bad tempered, hostile and overly aggressive, in addition to the strong black woman, the welfare queen, the baby mother. Black women are not a monolith and too often negative words have been used to decrease our right to speak. These gendered and racial discrimination that black women continue to experience, suppress, exclude and punish everyday black women whilst historically denying them sexual agency. This is an introduction to, to the album Spoken Word and Interludes. Host House won a BET Album of the Year 2020, considering the project was an EP and not a full album. The EP bridges entertainment with authentic storytelling and creates space for Black women's sexual agency. The first phase of the study was unpacking the six spoken words and interludes of the EP. Each tale spoken by Sutherland's friends and family who are named on the track sharing either life, sex or love stories. Whilst unpacking the spoken words and interludes, we changed the titles of the tracks to summarise what each story was sharing. Ownership by Antoinette speaks upon the equalities of sexual liberation between men and women. Victimised by Ari speaks upon the gender role sex power dynamics. Transactional Truth by Donna speaks upon commodifying the body for equitable exchange. Broken Love Story by Rashida speaks upon queer relationships and the impact of infidelity. Sorry But Not Sorry by Precious describes financial equality between men and women and unsurety of expressing agency. Self Worth by Amanda speaks upon social media's impact on one's consciousness. Antoinette's spoken word speaks upon the inequality of sexual liberation between men and women. When the woman takes a stance in regard to her sexual liberties, this can expose the fragility of a man. The patriarchal system has allowed men privileges such as ownership of the woman's body. However, Antoinette takes accountability for feeding into the patriarchal system and advocates to women to stop handing over the power to men by telling them that the pussy is theirs when in actuality it's ours. So what about British women? Sorry, what about Black British women, um, African-American experiences? In recent years, we've seen a rise in somewhat modern depictions of Black American women having control over their sexual agency and encounters on screen through TV sitcoms. Characters such as um, Olivia Pope in Scandal, um, how Annalise Keaton in How to Get Away with Murder, and Cookie in Empire, um, and Issa Rae in Insecure are just a few examples. These fictional depictions of Black American women provide voice and visibility to Black women living and loving in America and Black women across the Atlantic. Although some characters, traits, mannerism, behaviours and attitudes are exaggerated for entertainment, coupled with the reality that not all Black women will support, endorse or appreciate these depictions, um, some Black women viewing and engaging in these shows 
can relate to these depictions and see elements of themselves and their community embodied in these female characters. This indicates how mainstream entertainment can be used as a space to explore the private in public and vice versa. As fictional black women, we see these characters claiming space to explore their sexual agency and sexual freedoms alongside pursuing educational and professional trajectories, further highlighting their sexual behavior and practices remain intrinsic to their identity as black women, which is neither good nor bad, but a reality. There is a growing need to see depictions of black British women explore and navigate their sexual agency. The noughties classic Keisha the Skep, which was recently published by Jade LB, presents the story of a young black girl exploring her sexual appetite as a young woman, yet being shamed for her choices. Michaela Cole's Chewing Gum and most, and most recently I May Destroy You um, present similar themes of love, sex and intimacy from the perspective of a young black woman, alongside Candice Carty Williams' novel Queenie, which also echoes similar themes. As much as these works of fiction and creativity provide insight to some experiences of black British women alongside providing an entertainment factor, a variation of stories from a range of women living, loving and having sex in Britain is still needed, thereby highlighting black British women's sexual lives, sexual agency and voice as a significant gap within the literature. Only when we speak to and with black women can we begin to fill this gap in our knowledge base. To answer the question, why did this album impact black women? The album spoke to us. It spoke to Candy Spenbao, the 500 women in Clubhouse and Issa Rae. It gave us the everyday women a space outside of their private spaces to speak about life, sex and love narratives unashamed. It challenges misogynoir and patriarchal systems that have rendered our voices silent. Phase two of our research aims to examine the whole tales of black British millennium women for a proposed lens of misogynoir, feminist thought and gender politics to examine the work, women's tales. Storytelling a methodological approach, the research will contribute to black British feminist thought. And just as we end this presentation, we would like to leave with some words from the Combahee River Collective who say, if black women were free, it would necessitate the freedom of all people because it would require the destruction of all systems of oppression because black women experience all of them. Uh, we want to thank you for listening to our presentation and encourage you to connect with us online um, as we explore black female sexual subjectivity and the diversity of blackness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. As we prepare for our second paper, uh, just if you have any uh, questions, I'm sure you will, a fantastic paper, please put them into a chat gather them all together and we'll we'll ask some questions at the end, okay? Um, so we're coming up to the second paper now uh, called There Ain't No Black in LGBTQIA, presented by Wasuk Suli Pierce uh, from University of West London. Thank you very much, I'll hand over to you. Thank you for the introduction, um, my fellow panelists, and to everyone who was involved in organizing this conference. The title of my paper is There Ain't No Black in LGBTQIA. This was partly inspired by Paul Gilroy's There Ain't No Black in the Union Ja and Bell Hook's Ain't I a Woman. Now to kick things off, I have a quick teaser for you mathematicians out there. What is B plus LGBTQIA? Well, today I am adding black in LGBTQIA to make B L G B T Q I A. I will use this term from here on when referring to anyone that identifies as such. So overall in my presentation, I will define who is BLGBTQIA. Then I will explore racism within the LGBTQIA community. I will walk us through some evidence. This will be followed by an examination of representation within the LGBTQIA community alongside the data. Then I will cover the implications, recommendations, and finally, references which are available on request. 
So for anyone out there wondering who this powerful black woman is, it is Lady Phil, the director of Black Pride UK. When she turned down her MBA in protest of LGBT persecution by colonial regimes, her own LGBTQIA community came down hard on her. In response, she makes this very relevant statement. It is so hurtful when those that have faced oppression do not support another who is being oppressed. The moment you have a hierarchy of inequality, you have lost the fight already. Now think about that as I go on to define my terms. As you can see, there is a lot of depth here, and I feel it is important that I go through all these definitions with you. But first, let's all be very clear. Some of you may prefer to use labels other than BLGBTQIA to describe your race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Please know that I use this term BLGBTQIA in this paper as a convenience. Thus, I ask for your understanding if this term does not completely capture your identity. So when I talk about Black, I refer to someone who self-identifies as such and is a descendant of sub-Saharan Africa. When I say lesbian, this refers to a woman who is physically, romantically, and or emotionally sexually attracted to another woman and may identify as gay or a gay woman. When I say gay, I refer to someone who is physically, romantically, and or emotionally attracted to someone of the same sex. Bisexual refers to someone who is physically, romantically, and or emotionally attracted to someone of the same gender or to another gender. Transgender is an umbrella term for people who, whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from what is typically associated with the sex they were assigned at birth. Queer is an umbrella term used by some people whose sexual orientation is not exclusively heterosexual. Q sometimes stands for questioning, which refers to someone who is questioning their sexual orientation or gender identity. Intersex refers to someone whose sexual anatomy does not fit medical and social norms for female or male bodies. Asexual refers to someone with little or no interest in sexual contact with other people. No blacks allowed. So the norm in society is that one is white, they're male, they're heterosexual. And then so many layers underneath this to find BLGBTQI people. Their needs are neither known nor met. But some of you could ask, how about the LGBTQIA community? Isn't there where they can find safety? Well, with the evidence to come, we will see that LGBTQIA community lacks in racial diversity, is predominantly and is predominantly white. The races are segregated and the focus is very much on the white experience. This creates, in Lady Phil's words, a hierarchy of inequality. Unfortunately, BLGBTQIA individuals report feeling unsafe and not welcome in a community that claims to represent every LGBTQIA individual. It is very important to remember, in Dr. Martin Luther King's words, that nobody is free until everybody is free. And it is on the back of this that South Africa under the leadership of Nelson Mandela included into their constitution LGBTQIA rights and were the first country in the world to do so, something that other countries could eliminate. And now the evidence. According to research commissioned by Stonewall UK in 2017, 
61% of BLGBT people have experienced racism. This has been by way of exclusion from certain LGBT spaces, as Dahlia, not real name, testifies that. Casual racism is commonplace in LGBT bars and clubs. LGBT community events are largely white attended and white led. This can feel exclusive. Feelings of being the invisible other aren't nice and discourage me from attending events. In addition, BLGBT people are faced with racist language. For example, Kasim, who's 25 years old from, south, from the Southeast, highlights how walking into gay bars and drug queens are making jokes directed at me because I'm black on more than one occasion is pretty unwelcoming. Then shrugging it off by saying, I'm not racist, I have a color TV. And then a baby 34 from Scotland talks about how on more than one occasion, drunk people in an LGBT bar have come over to pet his hair and ask inappropriate questions regarding, regarding my race. Now, can anyone out there relate to what he's saying? I know I can. Then we have Lara, who tells us how the gay village and pride aren't welcoming towards people of color. The drag queens shout out, they shout out after us, calling us Beyonce or Whoopi Goldberg, which was slightly at first, but now it's really embarrassing every time it happens, as this brings a lot of attention to us and the other people in the club will start to join in. Last year at Pride, some guy bumped into me by accident, and when he realized I was black, he said, ew, and wiped his arm off in front of me. I don't go out as often anymore because of this. We've got more evidence, and this time from Ramo, a flick, who in March this year resigned after volunteering for over seven years as director of communications at Pride London. Ramo cited a culture of racism at the top with leadership insisting on ignoring black voices and ostracizing black volunteers. In addition, Ramo highlights how pride turn a blind eye to racism and allow openly racist bodies such as UKIP to march in the parade. Now, I know we're talking about racism, but I just want some of you to um, think about this. How many white people in senior management roles at Pride are volunteers and have been for over seven years? And, you know, we might as well ask, why is, isn't this talented human being fairly rewarded for his contribution to this organization? Once again, no blacks allowed, this time in research. The study on LGBT in Britain, home and communities commissioned by Stonewall in 2017 only had 6% of the respondents from a Black, Asian and minority ethnic background. This means that the number of respondents who were Black were even less. And when we look at mental health, data has shown us that very few studies worldwide explore the impact of multiple minority status of BLGBTQIA individuals who experience marginalization and subsequent stress. When we turn to higher education, there is little to no data that practitioners, policy and decision makers have to draw from. So they resort to other disciplines such as sociology, psychology or gender studies. What is more, there are no recognized frameworks for understanding the experiences of BLGBTQIA in predominantly white spaces. Five minutes, five minutes. So what are the implications? Discrimination, rejection, and social isolation leads to increased mental health issues. When one has a positive association with um, their sexual identity, they feel more connected to the community and less likely to have poor mental health outcomes. Reduced social connectedness has been associated with a higher risk of suicidal consideration. 
Social support and connectedness to the trans community has been equated with reduced depression and anxiety symptoms. In terms of representation, being excluded from, the, from research has been linked to a feeling of not being embraced or validated by the community. And disconnection from the community has been linked to a lack of solid conceptual framework upon which to build a cohesive identity. A lack of identity has been linked to a feeling of disjointed self or oneself. And finally, a feeling of disjointed cells of oneself um, has, been, um, has been linked to um, triggering psychological distress. So what do we do now? First, I propose that we undertake BLGBTQIA related research. This is exactly what I did when it came to my PhD. And as a result, I'm currently exploring how Black LGBTQ plus students' race, sexual orientation, and gender identity development impact their experience within the Black and white heterosexual community and the LGBTQ community, which is what this paper is about. This is a transnational study involving students in the UK, South Africa, and North America. The origins of this work lie in a research project I carried out in 2018 where I explored the experiences of Black pupils in the English education system. And the product is my upcoming book, Black Pupils Matter, Our Experiences of the English Education System, 1950 to 2000. I have also written five books for children aged seven to 11 that teach them about the geography of Africa. This is what you've been looking at. Now, getting back to the recommendations, we need to take Ladyfield's example and create BLGBTQI safe spaces. We need to follow Ramon's example and hold the LGBTQIA community accountable for racism, the lack of representation, and everywhere else they've let BLGBTQ people down. We need to support BLGBTQ work globally. And finally, we need to uplift BLGBTQIA within the Black community, just as Audrey Lord said. Without community, there is no liberation, but the vulnerable left to fight oppression on their own, something that BLGBTQIA individuals cannot afford. Also, E. Patrick Johnson tells us a story about his grandmother who was homophobic, but in her racial and feminist struggles, she passed on to her family different strategies that enable them to resist against different oppressions, including homophobia. I just want to leave you with that, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure you all have got many, many questions. So please don't be shy. Uh, put them into the chat and we will seek to get to them. Um, I think it's been a great session so far, right? So let me not even hold us up. Please uh, post your questions in the chat whilst we're preparing for the third and final presentation, which is going to be presented by Vanessa uh, McCauley. And Vanessa's uh, paper is entitled Stolen Breath. Stolen Breath. I'll say no more. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I'm handing over to you now. Thank you, Rita. And thank you to the rest of the panelists um, and the organizers for um, accepting my paper. Uh, I'm Vanessa McCauley and I completed my PhD this summer and I'm now a lecturer in contemporary performance at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm doing a different thing. I'm just gonna go straight into a reading and I won't be sharing a presentation. And I'm just gonna start. The filmed asphyxiation of George Floyd on the 25th of May, 2020 was the catalyst for a series of Black Lives Matter protests on both sides of the Atlantic. All of a sudden, the lived experiences of black people around the world started to become visible in a distinctive way. I am continually drawn back to think of the moment when I first watched the video. I return to this moment is due in part to its continuous circulation on mass and social media, but also largely due to my unexpected visceral response. At first, a gasp echoed by the people in wit witnessing it in real time. My heart quickens, my chest tightens, I hold my breath and tears spill out. Now in silence, my body stiffens in preparation for the scene of a black man's breath being forced out of his body. 
Simultaneously, I force air into my body. I sigh. I'm haunted by the phrase, I can't breathe, that replays, mutates, and manifests to me in various other forms. I can't breathe in classrooms. I can't breathe in prisons. I can't breathe in my bed. I can't breathe in a car. As Ashen T. Crowley writes, quote, I can't breathe the announcement through ventriloquizing some voice enunciating modernity's violence of what had been set in motion before him, a modality of thinking and conceiving black flesh as discardable, as inherently violent and antagonistic, as necessarily in need of removal, Remedi remediation, a modality of thinking and conceiving that is not American, but Western, global in its reach." End quote. The etymology of the plea, I can't breathe, doesn't belong to Eric Garner in 2014, nor George Floyd in 2020, but the first time that white people enslaved African people as early as 1560s. The phrase, I can't breathe, implies that care and justice, and even more simply the right to breathe, are not afforded to black people. It's now the 10th of September, 2021, and I take the tube towards Tower Hamlets. As I sit with my mask on, I take shallow breaths, counting down the stops till I can breathe fresh air again. As the train becomes more crowded, bodies start to reorganize themselves to, main, to maintain some level of distance. In rush hour crowds, someone sits next to me. I hold my breath. As I leave the tube and remove my mask, I take a deep breath, gluttonous for air. I walk towards Victoria Park. I'm aware of every inhalation and exhalation. As I reach the gate, I can hear the collective sound of recorded breathing and exchange of breath with some sighs and other long inhalations and exhalations. This is Immersion by Selena Thompson, a collaborative project that captures the breath of black women in Tower Hamlets. To quote, it's built from a chorus of breath collected in parks and spaces across the borough. The sound is a moment of cleansing and defiance, taking a sound we are surrounded by and tuning into its beauty at a time when breathing has never been so loaded." End quote. The performance of immersion, of immersion feels particularly heightened, not only by the global pandemic, but the performative potential of breath. Thompson describes the performance as, quote, a moment to remember the sacredness of air, of living in a constant cycle of inhalation, transformation and exhalation with the planet and each other. It is pushing back against the tickled throat, black snot and bitter aftertaste of ULEZ. It is a reminder that we cannot solve this, the decimation of our planet until we solve the gentrification and pollution of our cities. It is a reminder for us to remember what it is to breathe, end quote. The beginning of the performance frames the larger questions that motivate this chapter, this packed paper. What strategies do black women deploy to imagine ways of being? In what ways can black women's activism be linked to performance? And how might this provide grammars for thinking about black women in historic and contemporary contexts? Particularly significant for this research is the ways in which breath and breathlessness can be used as an aesthetic choice that can move towards presence and black liberatory practices for the present, an imperative that I locate in black women's performance practices. There are different examples of breath in this paper as I've moved from Selena Thompson to the historic formation of black women's groups in Britain, both of which contribute to the performative potential of stone and breath that I, de that I define as a desire to breathe and exist in the midst of anti-blackness. These examples can be arranged into two main provocations. The first is that breathlessness is tied to anti-blackness and determines who is free to breathe. The second is that breath articulates a performative strategy fixed upon black women's artistic work that points out the possibility of care, healing and agency in and beyond performance. I am interested in how breath redirects black being and knowing away from language and towards the flesh. 
To begin the paper with death is to be clear about the danger of the systems that control the spaces in, in which we can exist and breathe. This to me raises the stakes in how epistemology affects the very mechanisms of black life and death. Amber Jamila Musa writes that, quote, since becoming flesh depersonalizes and removes subjectivity, we can understand the production of flesh as one of supremacy's tactics of domination, end quote. We have, what we have to contend with now is the violent reversion to black, of black bodies to flesh. The modality of becoming flesh is a process of subjugation that is imposed by external forces, white people, systems, institutions, and capitalism. Despite the emancipation of black people, European, European and North American white culture continues to steal black life. Breath then as a visceral tool compromises the fungibility of blackness. The sale and purchase of black bodies is restricted to the flesh as breath isn't a fungible currency. Breath fills up this supposed empty vessel and endangers the price of flesh. To traffic in breath is to attempt to detach black life from the category of the, of the human. To argue that human capacity is determined in opposition to blackness, I use Christina Sharp's theorization of the weather. Sharp understands that the weather is, quote, the totality of our environments, the total climate, and that climate is anti-black, end quote. When we accept that the world the climate is anti-black, we have to imagine new ways to survive. Sharp complicates a conventional theory of the weather by theorizing it as an inescapable state of being as the climate of anti-blackness is located in the air. She writes, quote, I've been thinking about what it takes in the midst of the singularity, the circulant anti-blackness everywhere and always remotivated to keep breath in the black body, end quote. The word that Sharp arrives at for keeping breath in the black body is aspiration, which she defines as, quote, the withdrawal of fluid from the body and the taking in of foreign matter, usually fluid into the lungs with the respiratory current and as audible breath that accompanies or compromises a speech sound, end quote. Sharp identifies aspiration as a strategy to live within the totality of anti-blackness for black bodies moving in spaces that are structured against them. The word I would like to contribute to this grammar of breathing is suspire, which means to draw a long breath. The etymology of the word suspire is from the Latin word spire and sub, that translate to breathe under. In the Middle Ages, suspire also began to acquire meanings and lo of longing or yearning after. To suspire is thus both an expression of longing, yearning, desire, and a bodily reaction caused by that desire, the exhalation of breath. Suspire offers a way to finally breathe out. It is here that I locate stolen breath. This in part is prompted from the history of black women facilitating community spaces for themselves in Britain, organizing breath. Since black, women, since black women arrived in Britain, they have been self-organizing, creating spaces that recognize the simultaneous oppression of race, gender, and class. Before there was even a vo an available vocabulary for, that black women could use to describe the difficulties they face, they were creating groups in solidarity. Black feminist Hazel Carby writes, quote, Networks are reformed if need be with non-kin on, or on the basis of an extended definition of kinship by strong, active and resourceful women, end quote. The Brixton, Five minutes. The Brixton Black Women's Group from 1973 to 1989 and OAD, the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, 1970, 1978 to 82 are two notable examples. The women's liberation movement was shaped around white middle-class women's de uh, demands for gender equality in the 60s and 70s, which marginalized and silenced black women. With no alternative, black women activists created their own liberation movement centered within their experiences of black womanhood in Britain. The Vanguard Brixton Black Women's Group was formed in 1973 by a group of African and African Caribbean diasporic women, which was groundbreaking not least because it was the first 
black feminist group in Britain. The group utilized their liminal space to cultivate a political analysis, which they termed black socialist feminism. Black women continue to carve spaces for themselves as when OAD was founded in 1978 at Warwick University by feminists who were active in various black women's organizations. It is noteworthy that Margaret Thatcher became prime minister shortly after the collective was founded, demonstrating the dominance of right wing discourses with an agenda to keep British national identity white. Black women were systemically denied the right to safe spaces in the country through racialized and gendered policies in housing, immigration and public spending cuts. Against this hostile political backdrop, OAD's founding members uh, Beverly Bryan, Stella Dadsey and Suzanne Scaife have argued that there's no coincidence that, quote, a strong, vibrant, mili militant movement of black women emerged and that black women fighting back through political organising in Thatcher's Britain, end quote. In seeking to account the possibilities of breath and framing spaces for black women, I turn to John, John Thomas Trump Tremblay's conception of self-organising spaces and feminist breathing. Tremblay writes, quote, to articulate a genealogy of feminist breathing premise on the management of vulnerabilities requires that we grasp how breathing at the same time as it registers comes to repair fractures within and between communities, end quote. Put differently, to clarify the reparative possibilities of breathing for black women over time, we must recognize that breath as not only gasp, pants and sighs in moments of crisis, but opportunities to breathe as a collective, to be in the same space, breathing in the same air. The opportunity, this opportunity is exemplified in the formation of groups like OAD. This level of organizing created temp temporary microcosms for inhaling shared experiences and support and exhaling concerns and fears. In 1979, the first National Black Women's Conference um, surrounding health, education, law and immigration and how it affected black women. This is a significant moment in OAD's history as for the first time it brought these women together to discuss their own priorities. As I write now, over 40 years later, I think about the conference, about this conference, and I think about that conference and what it means to be together in the same space, breathing in the same air. Of course, the yearn for collectivity is heightened by COVID-19 and the new online format for conferences like this one that means the opportunity to be in a space and to breathe together in the same air is compromised. It seems particularly noteworthy that the methodology for collecting black women's stories has often been through oral histories, the physical exchange of breath, experience and knowledge spoken on the breath. The necessary gateway between history of black women's stories and the present day relies on the breath. Against the backdrop of anti-blackness, breath enables for me to produce other possibilities. As Christina Sharp writes, quote, living as I are, have argued we do in the wake of slavery in spaces where we were never meant to survive or have been punished for surviving and for daring to clear, claim or make spaces of something like freedom, we yet reimagine and transform spaces and practices of ethics of care as in repair, maintenance and attention as a way of remembering and observing that, observing that started with the door of no return. I want to echo Sharp's provocation with the potential to transform spaces by returning to stolen breath. Stolen breath is a choice to breathe in the face of anti-blackness. Sharp finds the locus of her thinking and what it takes you know, through, through the term aspiration and the term that I've arrived at is suspire, which articulates the longing for safety and freedom in an anti-black world. Um, the bodily reaction to this longing, I locate in the ability to finally breathe out, to sigh. This connects with stolen breath as it constitutes care and healing for black women that stages a theoretical and methodological potential of black fungibility as a way of articulating the mode of existence. I understand breath as a tool beyond its biological function and, I, and it relies on the possibility of repair, recovery and healing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. I want to say thank you if we could all give a round of applause for all three presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions or um, for, for the panelists, please do post them into the uh, chat and we'll be working through those. 
If we could ask uh, the panelists to turn their cameras on, please, the panelists, Natasha, Rihanna, Vanessa, and Wasuk to take some questions. So we're just going through these questions now. Um, Elizabeth is um, having having a look. And whilst um, while she is doing that, I just want to welcome Thank you so much. Our, our keynote who will be speaking later, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Oliver Totel. Thank you so much for joining us. I did see also, I believe, Gail Lewis. If you're there, Gail Lewis, welcome. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but just to say welcome. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Great paper. This is good, isn't it? This is good, oh. isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to be quick whilst we're getting some questions. I just want to say um, to the first uh, panel, Natasha uh, and uh, Rihanna, I was really very interested in this concept of this kind of um, black, these black American women who are creating space and you're looking at examples there. But well, I'm just wondering, because obviously you were very explicit in explaining what you did there about what you're thinking about in relation to black women closer to home. If you could talk a little bit about that. If you can. Do you wanna go ahead Natasha or should I? Don't mind. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'll talk if you wanna add, for sure you can say. Um, so our intention, I guess, is to collect qualitative data from Black British women about their own experiences. Some of this links to my own um, kind of research, which aims to explore how Black women access services, receive care from providers, and kind of understand what the gaps are and if there is a need to provide specific um, sexual reproductive health services for Black women to kind of support them and manage and navigate in their sexual experiences. Um, and Natasha, I guess you want to speak a bit more about on mute <laughs> apologies <laughs> um yeah i'm interested in um, looking more at the diversity of um black women in um in britain and as we said before it, we're not monolithic so and especially looking at set, set our sexual agency and our, our voices to um to speak upon such issues and ourselves and um, it's important for us to actually speak to real women um, um, across the UK from all different types of cultural backgrounds to really get a sense of what their experiences are. Yeah. Are you muted? I'm muted as well. Yeah. So Wasuk, I just wanted to come to you about your research because obviously you're using a lot of data, which is really important because a lot of this information is there, but it's not in the public domain. So, so where do you think Think you want to take this data what is your sort of immediate goals with this research that you're doing so the research i'm doing um is is like i said earlier it's a transnational study i'm looking at the um I, i'm looking at black lgbtq bus students um looking at their ident race sexual and um, gender identity development mm -hmm. so how that impacts how they experience whole communities that one, um, the white heterosexual community, because we know that within that, there, there's no similarities there. Um, and so they either separate from that community because they face racism and homophobia. Um, the second community that I look at is the black heterosexual community and how at whatever stage of their identity development, they experience that. And we know that within the black community, they experience homophobia. But just as um, E. Patrick Johnson um, um, stated in the quarter, um, I said earlier, is um, he mentions his grandmother who is homophobic, but through her um, feminist and other struggles, teaches them um, different strategies to deal with oppression. So we know that um, the black community might be um, where black LGBTQIA people actually galvanize and find um, a community to fight all other oppressions. I also look at the LGBTQ community, which is um, actually the paper that I've just presented. And um, as we've seen that within that, we've seen that they are marginalized, they face racism. Um, and then the fourth community is the black LGBTQ community, which is, um, they have similarities there. So the hope is that that's home for them, that's safe for them. Um, so I'm, Earlier on in my um, data collection, 
We'll and, come back um, to that if that's okay. Sorry, I, sorry to interrupt you, Asuk. Sorry, we'll yeah. come back to you if we can. It's just we're so tight for time. I just want to oh, get sorry. to Vanessa. That's yeah. all right. It's, yeah, we've got so much to talk about. Haven't we <laughs> we kind of need a break. Out Thank you. Kind of continue, but we'll come back. We'll come. This is only part okay. one. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? Yeah. Wink, wink. Yeah. So Vanessa, <laughs> uh, we just want to come to you. Obviously, we loved your 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 piece that you presented to us and the the idea of the concept of, of stolen breath and I was thinking very much obviously with the people in the room thinking about how black women come together this energy to create political change and, and I can say this because I was at an event at the ICA organized by Rihanna J Parker I don't know if she's on on this uh, zoom today but that power of having black women in the room, that energy, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that, because obviously you're, you're performing, aren't you? This is a performance, this is energy. If you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you for your question. So um, I try to think through, try to articulate that energy in a sense that um, when black women gather together, there's this kind of collectivity um, and I think through this idea of breath, through this and, and collectivity and what that might mean to reposition our bodies and like this very visceral sense of um, the breath and how it might be repositioned in a performative way. So the example of Selena Thompson's immersion is, an, is, a, is a great example because um, even during the time of um, not being able to gather together, um, she was able to facilitate a performance outside speaking with women, um, black women from Tower Hamlets and the borough more generally, and how uh, about how um, they experienced what they, what they experienced. And just that recording of breath, of laughter, of singing, um, seems to be like a reoccurring thing that I can trace from, like I said, um, the formation of black women's group in Britain. Elizabeth, I was just wondering if we could uh, go through some of these questions, if there's any that come to your mind. Okay, because I could yeah, read definitely. through. Definitely. Um, the whole panel has been so powerful. Thank you so much, um, all three of you. And um, I just smile when you mention singing, because I just think of my grandmother. Singing was her language. And um, the whole chat actually is reflective. There's a lot of appreciative uh, comments for each of the papers. And some people also pointing out that they were rather surprised at the racism uh, wasuk in the LGBTQIA community. So you've really illuminated uh, that um, as well. Um, but one question here, we've got a couple, but the first one here from Amira, amazing presentation. I was wondering whether you found that, I think this is for uh, paper one, I was wondering whether you found that the use of spoken word plus interludes in a musical context specifically as a medium, allows Sullivan to explore a sense of self and sexual agency. Um, I don't know, Natasha, if you'd like to <laughs> speak to that. Um, yeah, definitely. I believe that um, Sullivan has spoken on many interviews and said it was a platform for her to allow not just herself, but her friends and family to speak about their sexual, sexual um, experiences on this album. And what's nice about the album is that in between each track, it bridges um, the idea, whether it's talking about Anderson's Tale, that's then um, re-spoken about within the song track as well. So the ideas are always flowing throughout from each spoken word into the song track. So yeah, it gave not just Sullivan, but um, also um, her friends and family, that um, platform to be able to express their sexual and love and life experiences. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also have a question from Amara um, Livermore, who's going to be presenting a paper actually for us. Um, but she asks, what specific things would you like to see? Uh, and I think this is directed, it is directed to you, Wasuk. Um, what specific things would you like to see non B L G B T Q I A to do to elevate the voices and work uh, to better include the community? I think your last slide probably spoke to that a little bit, but uh, what, what would you like to see um, specifically? We need to, um, we need to propose like 
we need to fight for work. I mean, it's very hard to um, get work through that not only black LGBTQ, but just black work as it is to um, study. But we need to get these studies out to get um, to, to increase the data because the problem we have at the moment or what I'm finding is that um, I'm having to rely a lot on um, data from America or from South Africa because we don't have studies that are black LGBTQ related, um, be it in education, be it in um, national health. There isn't any information out there. So I think we need to start off with um, research. We need to propose to do work on um, what, you know, all the different aspects of, of LGBTQIA. We also have a question here from a representative from the TUC, just to say thank you very much for your talk and the TUC are getting better, um, but they're still of course pushing and there is a link there that's been provided. And there are 12 new other comments <laughs> as well. I'm so aware that time is against us. So I will um, dovetail back to the moderator, back to you, Rita, but um, thank you. lots thank of you so much. breath. Powerful yeah. concept, loving the concepts here introduced. Great discourse here, amazing presentation. Wow, thank you all speakers. Um, uh, just one, another one here. So the struggle and bravery of my mother and then um, generations of black women is being celebrated here. Um, our fight is normally downplayed or forgotten by this generation of black and brown women who forget the women's shoulders they stand on today. Thanks for acknowledging. There's more, you can see more there. So much more, so much more. But I think I would like in close probably just, I know you're here, Gail, and listening in, a lot of the research, you know, um, is really encapsulating in my own research. I'm finding a lot of us as researchers are, are trying to um, recover um, Black feminist work from, from the 70s and 80s in the UK, I'm trying to kind of you know, review that and make sense of it and try and relate it to the stuff that we're going through now. And it's really important for us to be speaking with with our elders, really, and getting that information so that we can kind of try and make sense of, of today. So um, I'm sure uh, a lot of these scholars will be reaching out to you, as I have, uh, for advice and um, for context. Of, of things, of how things actually were when you were in the room, because you know that you read things, but it's not the same as speaking to mm. someone who was there in the room. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that as we as we are about to close, briefly, if you're able to. Um, <laughs> yes, okay, <laughs> I'm really listening today and learning lots. Uh, I guess I'd like to say, yes, I think those conversations are really important that we have them, but I think that What's, what I'm noticing as I'm listening to now is the ways in which some of the themes that we were addressing are repeated in the scholarship, in the activism, in the thinking that's going on now, but they're also inflected differently. So I was thinking, actually, to be honest, I was thinking, oh yeah, go, let's talk about LGBT, etc., in a way that we would not have done at the first OED conference. So this is, this is something obviously we built the foundations for, but you guys are taking forward because we're in another moment. Um, the ways in which there's think more oh, pushing forward the work to say, what's the specificity of our place in this country as part of a Black, Black Atlantic formation, as came up in the Rasta talk too as part of a Black Atlantic formation? And what is the specificity and what's the repetitions? What's the, the doublings that go on? So I think really what I'm saying is, is it's very exciting for me to hear you all because I'm hearing echoes of stuff we did. I'm hearing the work being taken forward and I'm hearing new lines of inquiry that speak to now and show to me how um, the grandchildren are carrying forward the work that we grandmothers laid down. And that's important. So thank you. And I have to go and prepare my teaching now. So I thank everyone and, and apologies for not being able to stay for the, the keynote, but I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. You're thank naughty you. Rita for calling me. I know I was, I was, but you know I am, but you love me still though, innit? Thank you so much, Gail, thank you. And I wanna thank our pan panelists. If we could give a, a round of applause or a little emoji for our panelists, Natasha, Rihanna, Wasuk and Vanessa for your really inspiring papers.
inspiring papers. You didn't have a lot of time, but you just came strong today. So I feel energized. I'm going to pass back to Elizabeth, who's going to be preparing us for the keynote for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I suddenly feel terribly nervous. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we now just have, we've had a fantastic afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. It's just been unbelievable. And just when we thought it couldn't get any better, we're going to finish uh, on a high note um, with Professor um, Otelli, uh, Professor Otelli. Um, so this is just wonderful to, to have Professor Otelli uh, with us. Um, it just gives me just immense pleasure really to be able to introduce a woman of such immense intellectual scope um, and range uh, with the added gift of storytelling. Um, because I really feel that you start reading one of her works at the moment I'm reading, um, well, I was going to say her latest, but um, it's not the latest that came out in February. It's the one that came out last year, African Europeans and Untold History, which I'll hold up. But you start reading and you can't really put it down. Um, and Professor Otelli um, is just such an outstanding scholar, which you, I hope you will all get this book if you haven't already uh, read it. And it's just so sweet that she is a black woman in this space, um, conversing in such a way. But also, more importantly, she has just humanity. And I found her so very humble when, when I met her three years ago and approached her at Gresham College um, after a lecture that she had um, prepared and, and um, delivered. And quite simply, she just took the time to listen to all my questions. There were lots of people clamoring around her, but nevertheless, she gave us all um, time. And I've been pursuing her ever since to try <laughs> and get her to come to Goldsmiths. She's professor of history of slavery and memory of enslavement at the University of Bristol, the only historian with that title. She is a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Historical Society, which is absolutely fantastic, uh, considering the report that came out, I'm sure you're very aware of, of a couple of years ago, which stated um, that BAM students are not taking up history um, as they should. So it's fantastic to see and hear you. Um, and uh, Professor Otelli uh, will be uh, part of the, obviously she is part of that senior management team there at the Royal Historical Society and she's a trustee of the research com uh, committee at the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum. So you can see there, um, obviously, um, her credentials. She holds a PhD in history from, please forgive my pronunciation, Université Paris-Cat uh, at the Sorbonne, France. And her areas of research are colonial and post-colonial history, memory, politics, <clears throat> women, and the histories of people of African descent. Um, and it goes on. Um, but also we remember in particular this magisterial book, African Europeans and Untold History that came out. I can't believe it was 2020. What a year for it to come out, but fantastic because we were all in our homes and hopefully uh, able to read and reread. And very recently, um, earlier part of this year, she's um, edited post-conflict memorial, memori I can't say the word, I'm so um, um, excited, but post-conflict <laughs> memorialization, missing memorials, absent bodies, um, and that came out um, by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2021. She is a public historian. She's all over the media, all over Twitter, and it's just a great pleasure to have you, Professor Olivette. Thank you so, so very much for having me. I'm sorry I didn't uh, get a chance to, to come and, and join earlier. Um, I have been doing something that I promised myself every single year that I won't do, which is Black History Month, which is engaging with this very awkward um, thing where you, you have to educate people. There's some positive about it, but you also find yourself in spaces where you're explaining your very existence and your experiences and and um i'll need to, i always need time to reflect but i want to come back to uh what uh, vanessa said at the end this is for me a space to breathe so i have been doing something and practicing something since i was a child in, in paris which is i hold my breath i pull my punches i use my sharp tongue as a whip and then I create those spaces where I can breathe and just this is one of them. That's why I'm so happy it's recorded because I'll go back to this and I reflect 
and it gives me so so much courage and hope when i was growing up it was um i will hold my breath i didn't i, I grew up in an all white environment so i would hold my breath and then breathe only when I go to Cameroon to my grandmother, which is a long, a long time, you know, to, to hold your breath. But uh, it helps me practice something, which is you learn to choose your battles along the way. So um, I'm, I just prepared something um, that is related to both this experience, but also to things I was thinking about, about the ways in which we use our voices um, and perhaps share with you histories of liberations. The many, I looked at the program very carefully and the, the, the many um, uh, papers were mostly dedicated to contemporary settings. And I thought perhaps I could go back to the old school stories of liberation or, people might not see them as stories of liberation. So I want to talk about women's uh, representation, resilience, collaborations. So uh, my book, African European, came out, as you said, last year. And one of the things I noticed when I was promoting the book was that I never asked um, to talk about women. I was, I was never asked to talk about ancient figures, to talk about, for example, the Queen of Meroe or the Kandak of Meroe, which is nowadays Sudan the most powerful women, because they were queen mothers in charge of the education of the, of the king and holding incredibly, incredible uh, diplomatic and military powers. I, was, I wasn't asked to talk about it. Most people wanted me to talk about St. Maurice. Indeed, St. Maurice is an incredible character um, who, um, you know, who was born in nowadays Egypt. So he's an African European and who became such an important uh, a figure for, for European uh, religious and European hagiography and who became something, a symbol so much so that in the 30th century in Magdeburg, they erected a statue and there's another statue in France about him. So, or they, people ask me to talk about the legendary Roman emperor, Septimus Severus, who was the, the first African emperor uh, of the Roman empire and, 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 and so on. So uh, this led me to a discussion that I had with myself and, and a discussion that I have been having with many other women in the last 40 years, or maybe, maybe not 40, 30 years, let's say or so. And the discussions are always about women's voices. I've, it's no secret that for me that the voice that really shaped my journey is my grandmother's voice. And um, I was hearing her in those spaces that, um, but yeah, incidentally, I haven't been back home in the last five days so I just arrived and yeah it's also a breathing space family is a breathing space so I kept hearing her voice along the way during those um, five days and uh, so women's voice the ways in which they disappear in history when they appear how they are distorted and I wanted to go back to the Queen of Sheba because in my book I talk about her and nobody asked me about her and she appeared mostly in Ethiopian paint paintings and art and studies of the Bible and the Quran she also appears in 1 Kings uh, 10, in 2 Chronicles 9, the Hebrew Bible, and in the Surat uh, of the Quran. In the Hebrew, Bi uh, Hebrew Bible, she's presented as a wealthy queen who learned about queen Sol uh, King Solomon's reputation and wealth and decided to test his wisdom. In the Quran, it is Solomon who received reports about Queen of Sheba and threatened to invade her land if she and her subject don't start uh, wor worshipping uh, their many gods. And both stories are really about conversion um, to, a, to one single god uh, religion. They're about submission to God, but they're more than that. In the New Testament, her name is changed to Queen of the South, Luke and Matthew. And further changes of the story are to be found in the Aramaic version of the book of Esther where Solomon sends uh, the hoopoe bird to the queen and commands her to travel to, to his place. So the encounter is given on a, a new meaning, a new twist, twist when crossing a glass floor, uh, she mistakes the glass floor for a pool. Uh, Sheba pulls up her garment and shows her hairy legs. This seems anecdotal, but uh, bear with me. And from that moment, she was associated with demons because her body hair uh, was typically attributed to men or demons. In this case, it also shows that foreign women, and I identify with that, who worship different gods were dangerous to the family structure and social order. And I come from a family where Catholicism is there, animism is there, 
um, uh, Islam is there and so on and so forth. So as, as it's about these women navigating not only the social order, but also the religious order. So in those settings, to come back to the Queen of Sheba, women's role uh, were to oversee the education of children, the well-being of the family. So this image uh, disturbed many. The representation of the Queen of Sheba in European arts also uh, was also uh, interesting in terms of otherness. So according to uh, medieval readings of Songs of Songs, uh, we have uh, Queen of Sheba who declared to Sir Queen, uh, King Solomon that I am black and beautiful. But in the 30th century sculpture of the Queen at the Saint Anne portal of Notre Dame uh, Cathedral in Paris, we have Kim's King Solomon and Saint Peter surrounding her, and they are all the same color, which, he, which one assumes is white. Later on, in another painting by Lavinia Fontana, uh, in 1600, she's again white. So we see here the fluidity of the queen that plays into the perception of that otherness may not have mattered that much, uh, especially the otherness or, or, or rather uh, uh, African women, their color did not matter that much at some point. But things are not as clear cut as that because the following century stories about uh, the encounter between the queen of Sheba and Solomon are mingled in Jewish and Muslim traditions and folklore. And she's seen as a temptress, half snake, half woman, seeking to seduce men, destroy their lives. And by an interesting twist, Muslim stories about the queen being half snake um, equate her with the Hebrew female demon Lilith, where um, are transformed and circulated in European literature. 19th century literature also uses her figure. We found her in, in the work of um, novelist uh, Flaubert. Um, the artist Odilon Redon reproduced an illustration of her again, and we are again presented with a woman who's now, and this is crucial, her features are not white, are not black. She, the features suggest that she's dual heritage. So the, 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 the change in color we are in the realm of racial uh, ambiguity that uh, uh, seduced 19th century poets uh, and that uh, kept on going um, the following century. She's perceived as deceivers, exotic, and she's depicted, uh, depicted by um, Charles Baudelaire's um, um, uh, poetry or, or rather uh, verses, The Dancing Serpent. So she's an African European who has been transformed white, black, dual heritage. Yet nobody asked me one single time about her, about what it means for 21st century Britain. Now I could of course spend the last of this presentation telling you about the power of another category of women, the Black Madonnas in Europe, and in particular Our Lady of Montserrat or the Virgin of Montserrat in Catalonia in Spain, Black Madonna in France, Black Madonna in Poland and so on. And these Madonnas tell us something crucial about, again, European trajectories, European perception of, of, women, of women, and in particular Black women, and the place of Black women in the Roman church in the 12th and 13th century Europe. And these perceptions actually contradict the, um, the representation of people of African descent, or, or rather the, the gaze or the perception of people of African descent that we have in the interpretation of the Bible through the malediction of Ham. So we move from Black Madonnas being all powerful, giving us some sense of elevation, if you would, not just religious elevation, but um, um, uh, some agency to 18th century, uh, the following centuries actually representation of Black bodies is powerless. However, these are not the only points I want to make. By the 15th, 16th century, before the arrival of the Portuguese and the Spanish on the West Coast of Africa, we start noticing that Venetian uh, merchants who have been trading in human beings and who have been specializing in Eastern European slavery has started lower, lowering the prices for African women sold to Arab traders and, and sold to European monarchs, sold to those on the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, that is quite important. So there's a devaluation. Uh, the marketization of black body has led also to the devaluation across centuries of these women physical devaluation, of course, mental devaluation, but even their mental perception of capacities are not even discussed at that point. It's not about that, that thing, um, that point. And black female bodies seen as commodities started to um, 
even as, as, as commodities started to be devalued. And by the time we reached the 18th century and at the heart of Europe's so-called enlightenment period, women's voices, black women voices have become a tool between slave traders and, and abolitionists. Really, even they're using black women's bodies as a tool between themselves. These are about uh, people racialized as white. And the, again, black women are, are just a tool to uh, scoring points, mechanisms. And I'll give you an example. In the testimony of Mary Prince, for example, we see the trend with a debate or even a controversy that followed those who have adopted the abolition and those who supported it. So uh, for those who don't know the story of Mary Prince, she was born in Bermuda, uh, was taken to London by those who owned her body and managed to escape. She was protected by a group of women, white women, and by a man called Joseph Springle, uh, Pringle, sorry, a Scottish uh, abolitionist in London. She shared her life story with them as an enslaved woman and was put into, and that was put into writing. But the former owner sued Pringle for libel, won the case, and it became the story about those two men who basically were fighting for the damage that was done for their, uh, on their, uh, to their reputation. We don't know any single thing about Mary Prince after that. And to me, that is the most important part of the story because this story of liberation did not place her at the heart of liberation, did not place her at the heart of the narrative beyond her testimony. Yes, the testimony served the abolitionist cause, but ultimately we don't know what this individual woman's story, uh, uh, um, more about this, this individual uh, story after public exposure. Uh, discarded she was, completely discarded. Her voice, her life was silenced, reduced to a drop on the book of the, uh, the, the story of abolition. Most of you have heard about the Quiano and others, but to me, this is an example of what Francis uh, Beale called years later, well, century late, centuries later, in 1969, the double jeopardy in her pamphlets, double jeopardy to be black and female. It is also an early example of how discrimination and privilege work when it comes to gender, race, and class as framed by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 in her work on intersectionality, because we are here in the realm of the legal status of women and their, uh, um, uh, and their rights uh, in society. Fast forward, we have Sojourner Truth. And I'm not going to dwell on her life, but what I want to say, and you probably know this, but I, I want to remind some people that this sentence, entire women propelled generations of women, and in particular women of color, black women into action. It has since been revealed by historians that Truth spoke Dutch before she could speak English. So it was impossible for her to have adopted that turn of a phrase, uh, um, the turn of a phrase of a black woman from the American South. In fact, um, uh, the transcript, trans transcription of her speeches was distorted by Frances Gage, um, a, a white female uh, early abolitionist um, um, who, who decided that, you know, uh, it was more important to have um, the voice of uh, a black woman spoken in, in southern uh, parts of the United States because it would be apparently more powerful. More importantly, she should have had that Dutch, New York State Dutch, light Dutch uh, accent, which would have told, an, uh, uh, told another story, which is the involvement of uh, the Netherlands in the transatlantic enslavement. And that was erased from that dialogue. So for me, um, this is quite an example. Well, people speculated saying that no, it was to give the speech more power and all that and, and, and so forth. For me, this is an example of a paternalistic, if not maternalistic sentiment, which often equated people of African descent uh, during the European colonial, colonial era to either noble savages or to children with big hearts, but with low intellect, unable to look after themselves and uh, uh, unable to, to speak properly. So this to me reveal another point. She's, it, it, it is about how black women in subsequent uh, centuries were able to reappropriate a, disco, a dis, distorted speech and how this can be served and can be used an ex, as an example of resilience and as an example of uh, uh, forms of activism. This is about the ways in which black women carve spaces to survive, thrive in hostile environments. They did so by compromising 
engaging with the master's tool to provide themselves with temporary breathing spaces while still plotting to escape. As exemplified by the many stories of runaway enslaved people in the 18th and 19th century US. Another example closer to us, perhaps in time, which is the story of the Nardal sisters, born in Martinique, French Caribbean, between the wars, educated in Martinique, then Paris. And they took France by surprise by displaying a thorough knowledge of the power dynamics and were able uh, uh, to engage with uh, discourses about women's bodies. While Josephine Baker was trying to carve a place in the world of entertainment in Paris by displaying her body, the Nardal sisters were warning white France about the dangers of exoticizing black women and thus contributing to stereotyping and the dangers of such uh, endeavor. Incidentally, Josephine Baker, who had made a name and a fortune, also worked uh, uh, during the Second World War as a spy for the French government. And during the war, uh, 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 and after the war, she dedicated, where well, she also participated in the civil rights movement, funded uh, uh, instances and uh, um, uh, um, funded uh, the, the movement uh, and before dedicating the rest of her life adopting vulnerable children and uh, hosting them in her house or castle uh, in France in the Dordogne region. So it is about what we think it is, you know, it is about navigating waters that are threatening to drown, to drown black and brown bodies and how black women, brown women have found ways to engage, even manipulate their environment. And I want to come to the question of agency. Becoming mistresses of one's own narrative is exactly what Anna Julia Cooper's trajectory is about. She was born in 19th century. In her voice uh, from the South and the following pamphlet, she demonstrated how scholarly production and activism are put into practice through a commitment to educating people of African descent, while her contemporaries were also doing that and were engaged in debates uh, about the fate of the so-called Negro. So she wanted a practical uh, um, uh, um, um, conclusion to, to her work. So I want to stop here and let us reflect on a few points. Can one engage simply in fighting against stereotyping by denouncing the way people of African descent are represented? In other words, is public activism about the white gaze a powerful tool against the many forms of racism? I have no answer to this. Well, I do have answers and opinions, but they shift. Example of scholarly activism is being invited on national television to debate racist, an example of scholarly or an example of activism. Equally important, should we discard people who do so? Is scholarly activism about writing about these debates only and staying clear from those debates, the televised, the public uh, debate? Is it activism to write about it only? Is it Activism, activism about creating our own space because we do not believe that a house built by the master can be dismantled by the master's tools. Many people believe so, that we cannot dis dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, Audre Lorde and many others. In our fight about, fight about dismantling the master's house or building our own, is, is it where the fight is? Is it about doing both? These are questions I've been grappling in the last 30 years or so, 40 years. Is it possible in 21st century Britain to dismantle that house? Or should we find ways forward to implanting ourselves, implanting the peripheries in the core to create the space, a bit like an apple being eaten by, not worms, by people? until it is not anymore. Is that even possible? I have again, no answer to these questions. And it is at this stage impossible to know which road is the best one because we're living it, we're in it. And yet some people have managed to live it, get some perspective and carry on. 
What I do know though, is that carving our spaces while fighting discrimination is a difficult and long-term battle. It's an exhausting battle. It's a battle that has an impact, a huge impact on mental health. I want to offer another comment. It seems to me that we cannot necessarily replicate the American path because black British history and experiences are different. But we can certainly learn from our African uh, American brethren. As I have had the privilege in the last few decades and um, to do so. And yesterday I was at the inauguration of the first ever chair in women's history supported, well, in the world, supported and funded by donors close to Hillary Clinton. Among such donors, from those that I saw were all white. And I want to remind you this, this is the first ever chair in the world on women's history. It is significant to me that Secretary Clinton chose a black woman to be the first holder of that chair. It is in Oxford, implanting a black woman in Oxford, bypassing the barriers that many black British women are facing in academia and planting her at the top of this. It is also significant to me as I learn, um, well, I have seen the figures before, but actually getting to talk to one of her aides, I learned that black women were the biggest group to vote for Hillary Clinton in the presidential election, the last one. That tells me something about the many forms of allyship in the US context. Again, my final point is about making our voices heard and having our stories amplified. If we have time, we can have a conversation about this, but I want to remind ourselves, I want us to be reminding ourselves constantly that what sustain us is not reinventing necessarily the wheels, but adapting our tools to fight, to engage, to um, open our spaces. Adapt them also means that you have a clear, or not a clear, but at least some understanding of, of what has been done before. I found myself not preparing for um, my part of the speech yesterday in Oxford. And then, you know, prior to this, prior to the, the, the speech, we, we have been talking with colleagues in Oxford um, about uh, the climate change. And I was really frustrated by the fact that none of them and not many people have been talking about climate change and the environment in relation to women from the global south and women from the global south have been engaged in that fight for such a long time. I was born on the edge of the rainforest. My grandmother significantly engaged in that fight because it had such an impact on, on, on her life uh, um, as a child of, of the forest. So I had to remind people that fact, but also the fact that, and, and this is an important part, it is about bringing people to, um, to references that they can, they can understand. So I gave them the example, they can relate to as well, that resonates. So I gave them, you know, me telling them about my grandmother has no significance to them, has no meaning to them. So I had to remind them of somebody who was born much later, um, remind them about Wangari Matai, remind them that the climate emergency, the environmental issues have been raised in the 1970s by a black woman, a Kenyan born woman, a woman who was a scientist, a woman who had studies in, studied in the US. And decades later, in 2004, she received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, not for her work as an environmentalist, but because she brought communities together there was no prize, there's no Nobel Prize about people fighting for the environment. And in 1977, she created a, a movement called the Green Belt Movement. So to me, it's an erasure and bringing about those stories is finding ways to bring them back in a way that resonates with majority, the majority group. Because at this point in time, I realized that the power to do something uh, and, and to transmit that story at a larger scale reside in their hands. So I had to use the tools that those women that I, I just mentioned before 
uh, the now Dow sister, Josephine Baker, and, and, uh, um, uh, and others, and Anna Julia Cooper, of course, to engage with a dialogue. You know, my, my, my aim is not to please the majority group in this country. My aim is for us to carve a space and I will do what I can um, to do so. And um, that's about it. I would like to really engage with you in discussions. Wow. Well, Professor, that was just um, a tour de force, of course, mm -hmm. uh, setting the whole um, uh, context uh, for us, um, injecting some more history. We did have a paper that referenced um, Sarah Bartman uh, or Saji Bartman um, as well. So it was great to also have um, these former mothers of us. I love your last sentence um, about your aim is not to please the majority in this country, but to carve out um, a space. Um, and I think that if you are running for political office, you've got um, at least uh, 79 supporters here who might dig into their pockets. It's just fantastic um, to hear you speak quite boldly because um, there's so much here, um, but the impact on mental health and the sacrifice of speaking out and not saying, um, going against then I should say, um, the usual majority um, sort of understanding and what is said um, is very high. It's a very high price and it's quite lonely at the top, um, to be quite frank. And it's always amazing as well how these subject areas can be hijacked. And as Black people, we're very familiar with that, the hijacking of our music, of our style, of our hair, of our this and our that. And yes, I mean, where did we learn about the environment? Was it not from our grandmothers who learned it from their grandmothers and great grandmothers? But of course, the difference is, is that they didn't have um, the power. They didn't have the money. They couldn't fund um, the earth shot prize, uh, could they? And get all those backers. And uh, it's, it's quite powerful, again, what you said about um, um, Secretary Clinton and the money that she was able to generate. And, I think the first question that jumped to me was, well, we have many, there are many black billionaires um, throughout um, America now, actually. So, but maybe they didn't see that as um, a particular target. I know there are other targets of, um, you know, um, education, et cetera, well, um, as it, well. Uh, sorry to interrupt. It's something that yeah, no, please. me. No, no, it really is something that troubles me. <laughs> because yeah. we, we, I, I don't know, I have no answer. I, ha I don't really, how can I put it? I'm not really in their circles. So actually ask them the question, what are you doing? <laughs> well, if anyone can get in their circles, it should be you, shouldn't it? Because of the platform now um, that you have. I thought to myself, are you going to be at COPAC, um, is it COPAC uh, next week um, in Glasgow? I um, can't. I mean, it's, <laughs> and then again, why should you just fall on one person's shoulders? Um, it's uh, creating that critical mass um, as well, isn't it, of people. But thank you um, about reminding us about the Queen of Sheba um, and of course, uh, Mary Prince and Sojourner uh, Ruth. I've never heard uh, particularly of the Nadal sisters. So that was quite interesting, that contrast you had of the Nadal sisters with Josephine Baker. Um, I am just very aware of the time and that um, I just want to give other people's uh, 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 voice here. This was awesome, food for thought. Um, I've always been interested by the Queen of Sheba and how she is portrayed. Fascinating to learn about her. Very interesting to learn also about Mary Prince. That came from um, Annette. The importance of the environment and how Black women and people are affected by climate change. Um, and we did have a, a paper earlier on um, by Lydia, um, who I believe is at Cambridge, University of Cambridge, and she presented a paper um, I don't know if uh, Lydia is still online, a green black feminist theory, black women and ecology. So that might be Lydia, if you're still around, um, it might be good to send Professor Otelli your, your paper. Um, very interesting to learn about black women voted for Hillary Clinton <coughs> and uh, the first black chair. Who is the black chair for that position? I heard when it was coming up, but who is it? So it's Professor Brenda Stevenson. She Brenda is Stevenson. outstanding because during her presentation, you can find it online. During her uh, presentation, 
boom, here she is telling us about the story of that black woman who created a whole archives uh, because she had enough of the ways in which uh, their stories were not taken into account in the 19th century, early 20th century, and, and, and how she basically reshaped the way we do, um, they, do his, they did history in her community. And, and uh, uh, again, you, you see people listening because she's in a position Mm. where people can listen because you know the fact that we have been doing archival material in our communities is not a new phenomenon mm. but then they're hearing for some people it was the first time they were hearing this and i find it quite interesting is she african-american or yes she is mm. from virginia right right um okay uh let's just go through again oh Every time I go up, another message comes down. Thanks for mentioning Kenya as East and Horn of, of Africa um, and such women as the Queen of Sheba. Oh, keeps jumping up. Um, somebody else is saying, can't wait to read about uh, your book, African Europeans, and they themselves are Ethiopian. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's just see um, if we can see any more questions. I don't know if Juanita. Um, here as we're, we're at the end, Anita um, wants to come in, or Angelina. Um, hello, Angelina, Angie. Oh, hey, hello. <laughs> hello, Professor Otelli. Hello. Uh, just absolutely thrilling uh, to have you here uh, this afternoon, uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I was thinking about what you said about um, Mary Prince, and um, I done a bit of work on, on Mary Prince and the fact that she was um, consequently not only um, a, co a consequence of this sort of a court case that she was disappeared, uh, wasn't even mentioned, um, but also the way that her even her narrative was altered um, yeah. in that certain things weren't even included in her narrative because they didn't want her to be, they didn't want her to be sexualized. That was one of the things that was very interesting. Um, they didn't want to talk about the fact that she had been assaulted, raped uh, repeatedly and uh, assaulted. Uh, they didn't feel it was right uh, for, for the narrative to be presented in that way. And I keep being uh, thinking about this um, particular kind of um, uh, thought that kept coming through, um, which was, when I think about Frederick Douglass, for example, and the way that he would um, he would offer a very good critical analysis of his situation and of his life uh, as an enslaved person, and how uh, the audiences didn't like that. They didn't like that he was talking and speaking so eloquently about uh, uh, and analytically about what was happening to him. And so it was like, um, give us the facts, they would say, and we'll take care of the philosophy. And uh, that is a thing that I'm sort of thinking about, even uh, in regards to Mary Prince, but not only to Mary Prince, but also to uh, women's uh, experiences and, um, and, uh, and the fact that in, even in this uh, conference, how we are uh, giving scholarly attention to black women's lives and how um, this, this, the philosophy uh, is often being uh, taken care of by others. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this is particularly striking and particularly interesting. So I think, you know, really just wanted to say what a treat we've had today, what an absolute treat we've had by the people who, the individuals, the young scholars, researchers who have presented their papers to us this afternoon, and to you, Professor, by coming in and again, giving us real uh, pause for thought about how our lives are being, uh, how our stories are being told um, mm. and how it's important for us to gain control and in terms of uh, telling our stories and presenting our perspectives and our philosophies. Um, so uh, just want to say thank you and to thank you to thank everyone you. who presented their papers today. It's just been absolutely thrilling to be part of this, uh, this, this conference. Thank you so very much for, for all of this. And I just, um, I, unfortunately, I, I uh, you know, I, I come in through these questions, but I, I don't have an answer. I mean, I'm 51 and I'm still struggling to see what's the best route for us. Um, and I, yeah, but, uh, you know, you, you find out as you do it, you know? Yes. And, yeah. 
I don't have any answers either, but the fact that the questions are being raised is very important and we should be reflecting on these questions and taking our time to, uh, to answer them uh, as best we can. And there's not going to be just one answer, is there? There are going to be so many different responses based on a range of personalities and experiences. Um, but that's all right, I think, um, because as so many people have said in this conference, we are not a monolith. Um, we have we have to be mindful of that, and we often are being placed in boxes um, for the for the comfort uh, and convenience of others, and we have to pay, may be mindful of that as well. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Otelli. Um, just want to have a note of thanks uh, for those who made this possible um, this afternoon. Must thank. Uh, Jessa Mockridge, um, also thank Althea Greenan, thank Corinne Morose, um, obviously thank you my co-hosts Angelina and Juanita, really looking forward to tomorrow, the second day, um, Angelina will be opening up for us, so we're looking forward to, to, <laughs> to, to what she has to say and Juanita will be uh, closing and concluding. Um, thank you especially to those who presented papers. It's very, very hard work. And the moderators in particular, getting everybody together. Um, th this has been recorded. So everyone that registered uh, will get a copy. I will definitely be listening um, again uh, to all of the papers. And Professor Otelli asked so many questions and I was writing them down and so many different <laughs> um, streams and avenues there. Um, I was thinking of, but um, I know it's very late now, um, and I just wish everyone a very good evening, and we will be obviously in, in contact, um, Professor, as well. Thank you very much, everyone, and just give yourself a round of applause, really. Also, I wanted to thank so much uh, Jessa and Corinne for their amazing technical skills, um, amazing moderators, who have just helped keep us uh, on time and just it's just been fantastic we've made we've all i'm so grateful to everybody who's made this today this first day such a wonderful wonderful experience for everyone so thank you thank you marilyn and thank you to the library thank you okay. have a good evening everyone see you all tomorrow